Hey y'all, I hope everybody can uh, hope everybody can see me, hear me. Yes, no. Hopefully, I see lots of people in the chat. This is wonderful. I see people from all over the world. Hi, Julian from France. Um, someone was from Brazil. I read that. Where did I read that? My goodness. Um, yes, I see Toulouse, France. Mark Grisby's from Oregon. Thank you, Mark, for joining in. I see lots of Patreon people here. Hello, hello. And I am waiting to see if you guys are, are hearing and seeing me. Am I, am I online? Does it look good? Everything okay? Um, excellent. Hi, Jerry. And oh, DA, oh my goodness. Deepak, are you here from Jakarta? It's like two in the morning your time. <laughs> I can't believe you're online. Good morning, good morning. Uh, I see people from Australia. Awesome, Maximus, you're from Australia. That's wonderful. Good. Oh, thank you guys so much for joining. Oh, Alchemal Spirit, you're here. Lovely. Good going, guys. Yes. And and Deepak, what a trooper. I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be exhausted getting up this early to see this live. Um, <laughs> so thank you. I you you honor me by this. I just bow to you and and I really appreciate it. So hello and hello from Quebec. Thank you, Lawrence, for joining. Wonderful, everyone. Everything looks good and uh sounds good. Hello from Bloomington, Indiana. Okay, great. And oh, and someone else we've got, is this Dustin? Dustin is also from Malaysia. Oh my gosh, so it's very early there too. Well, thank you so much, uh, all of you who have joined me from the other side of the world and, you know, locals here at home. Uh, this is, this is finally, I, I can't believe we're finally getting through the, the complexities of the Earth's magnetic shield, right? Uh, you, who, who knew the, the magnetic shield would be so intense that uh, that we'd actually need three courses to do it. But uh, that's how long it took. So uh, today we will end up closing out this discussion and so we can move even lower into the Earth's upper atmosphere and talk about an area that I know a lot of people are gonna love, which is the ionosphere, because I know a lot of you are amateur radio operators. So uh, we will, you know, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> but for now, we still have some really fun stuff to talk about. And I even was doing a little bit of digging this um, just yesterday and, and a little bit today, and I found a couple other things that are very cool that I'll, I'll share with you uh, just in, in doing some digging to answer a few questions. So uh, that, that'll be nice to add. Hello from Germany. Oh, good. Thank you, Jurgen. I'm so glad you guys are you're here um, in West Texas. This is fantastic. Thanks you all for, um, for joining me. And definitely know that um, if you see two gentlemen, that's Jerry Ryan and Mike Richardson. I've seen them both in the chat. Uh, they are the moderators and uh, they are VIPs for my Patreon community. But we also have Chris who is a, a, a VIP, so be nice to him, as well as Nick Gaspard, who might also show up. Um, they are all VIPs in my Patreon community, so they will be talking to each other and making sure everybody behaves nice, nicely, and they also are, are pretty knowledgeable, so you, so you can definitely ask questions in the chat, and there's a very good chance that they will be able to answer some of your questions, even if I'm not able to get to them, but also, if I if a question isn't answered, don't be discouraged. Just keep asking because I, I there have been so many times where questions will go by so quickly I don't get a chance to see them, and um, I do take pauses during the course. Just so you know, these courses are typically very long. Uh, this one will be at least two hours, I would think, and uh, I will take pauses during during the you know periods when we get certain concepts down. And the reason why these courses are long is because I'm trying to give you basically a month worth of class time in one sitting. <laughs> so don't feel that you have to, to uh, do all of this at once and sit through the whole thing. Uh, it is meant to be taken in chunks and uh, obviously learn at your leisure. But if you're, if you're um, you know, uh, brave, <laughs> I guess is the word, and are willing to, to put yourself through the punishment, absolutely enjoy the whole class uh, because it is a lot of fun and it's a subject that, um, you know, space weather and the near Earth space environment is a subject I love very much. So without me getting too deep into all of that sentimental stuff, let me thank all these wonderful people behind me. First, I'm gonna thank the um, VIPs, of course. As you can see, I've got quite a few of them now and all of these people, are the VIP members of my Patreon community. They are the ones that help me steer the ship. 
we have meetings once a month and we talk and, and oftentimes meetings prior, you know, in, in and around that just individually, because they all have access to me. They have access to my cell phone. They call me, we text, we talk, and um, they help decide what, what, where this community is going, what I'm doing on the Patreon project, where we're developing things. Uh, I really try to make it, you know, community based in the sense that I am not just up here doing what I want to do. I am up here trying to serve you. And so these folks here are the ones that help me discover and decide what, how best to serve you all. So I am very much indebted to them because they have ro rocked my world in so many wonderful ways. And uh, hopefully they'll continue to do so. And then of course, I've got all of the mini course patrons. Oh my goodness. Thank you all here. Cause these, this is the reason why these courses have, have, have ever been made possible. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. And you guys have allowed this to become the baseline point of departure for the courses that I teach at Millersville. Uh, and I'm teaching them to meteorologists. So hopefully we are training the new generation of what we call modern meteorologists who not only have terrestrial weather chops, but now they have space weather expertise as well. And eventually <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Uh, we're going to start seeing this type, these types of reporting on, you know, your local evening news, especially when space weather storms and, you know, solar storms are en route or en route. And, uh, you will also find that you can believe and trust these people. So that's where we're going, hopefully, is that we're gonna start having actual weather people be able to give you credible information on space weather that you can actually trust and not have it be a bust. Uh, that's, that's where we're sorely lacking in, in public dissemination of space weather, that's for sure. So again, thank you to all, the, um, all my mini course patrons. You also decide, where these courses are going, what subjects are being taught. So if anyone is curious, how do we come up with the idea of what to teach and how, it's all these folks. So, um, and they also get advance notice when we're going to schedule these. So if you join my Patreon community, you can get access to all of this stuff and have direct dialogues with me. Uh, we really are one, a huge happy family and we are very encouraging to one another. So it's not, you know, contentious at all. Uh, we're all here to learn and we're all here to encourage one another. Okay, so, oh, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate you putting that in there. <laughs> Two hours to kill, I'm ready, okay. <laughs> yes, for the brave hearted, yes, not for the faint of heart. But again, I will be taking breaks, so please don't feel, I'm not gonna be offended if you can't last the whole you know, class. It's, it's expected that you can kind of digest these courses, each one of these courses over the span of a month, because that's when the next course will happen, okay? So feel free to take your time, or rewatch as some, as some do. Or binge watch, as Mike Richardson did last night. Mike, you are a god. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. Nick Gaspard's here. Good to see you, Nick. Um, yeah, you made it. Very cool. Okay, guys. So let's jump into it. What I'm going to do is I am going to... Um, oh, my gosh. Valley View, excellent question already about El Nino or La Nina. Yeah, there's actually a paper on that right now. Um, uh, not Macintosh. Bob Lehman. Uh, Bob Lehman et al., um, from NCAR, UCAR, those that those guys are really working together with terrestrial meteorologists, and it looks like the Terminator, uh, if you're familiar with that phrase. So as as we cross this Terminator, which we may be doing right now, you actually reverse from an El Nino to a La Nina, um, or vice versa, I forget, uh, event. I forget which way it goes. <laughs> Tells you how much terrestrial meteorology I know. <laughs> Scary. But... Um, yeah, there's there looks like there are correlations, and it's not and it's repeatable. So it's a very interesting paper to read, and I think it's I'm not sure if that one's done in Nature, but it's very easy to find because it's um, you know it it was recently uh, published and it's gotten a lot of press. So look for Bob Lehman L E A M O N uh, at all, and look for NCAR UCAR, and it's that team that's been doing that research. So uh, it's a good paper, good good read. Okay. Wonderful. Guys, I, I will, what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to review, since this is the last course of this series, what I'm going to do is I'm going to review just a little bit, right? Because I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time, but what I, what I want to remind you of is that this is part of the second chef. Now, the second chef series is actually going to go through a lot of different regimes. We already, the first chef was regime zero, right? From basically the sun to near earth. And then we are in regime one which is the space weather effects in near earth space 
and inside Earth's magnetic shield. So that's, we've taken, just for regime one, we've taken three courses, my goodness. Then we'll jump into the upper atmosphere and then we'll jump into the ground uh, regime, okay? So the whole thing is the second chef. It's really not just the magnetosphere. It, magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetosphere and near-Earth space is really just the first part of what happens to space weather phenomena as they kind of get scrambled up, uh, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, on their way to the ground, causing effects at the ground. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out of this right here and just see where do I need to go um, for a tiny, tiny, tiny review. For those of you who remember a little bit, let me just remind you what the magnetosphere looks like. Okay, just for a second. Um, yeah, I'll start with this one. Whoops, i got to stand on this side. Remember the magnetosphere looks like this kind of almost like a teardrop cavity, okay? And you're seeing you're you're, you're seeing what I'm talking about look look kind of like ribbons or shells. Imagine if this thing were completely closed. You're, so so what you're looking at here is Earth over here, this little green thing, and then all this purple stuff. This is really magnetic field, okay? And they're they're and we've got it set up as ribbons. Not so much because the magnetic field is ribbons, but you always see magnetic field pictures with lines being drawn. And what that doesn't do is it doesn't let you take that concept and, and, and unfold it in a three-dimensional sense. Because these really aren't lines. They're really more like shells. And so that's what you're kind of seeing. So especially this front shell, you see how it's kind of curved and round? Imagine all of these are actually kind of like curved shells, concentric shells inside one another. And that's really how the magnetic field works, is it works as a three-dimensional thing, object, springy kind of thing, that when you kind of slice it in half, you can kind of start, start seeing the interior of these shells. And in each one of these regions kind of defines a different domain, and different things happen. And over the course of, you know, here's, here's an example of what you're used to seeing when you look at magnetospheric stuff. You just see magnetic field lines, right? All those little red lines around Earth. Here's Earth again. Right, and but all but you can think of all of these little red lines being extended out as shells, okay, as things that wrap all the way around. And inside each one of these areas, kind of defines a different region, a different regime, per se. So, like in here would be in the radiation belts regions, okay. So you get these jails; they end up being magnetic jails that cause particles to move certain ways, right? And we talked about that. I'm wondering if I can jump all the way down. Yeah, let me jump all the way down to this. I mean, it, let me know if I need to review L shells. Does anybody hand raised? Anybody need any review of L shells? Or we can? Are, are we finally after two classes of L shells <laughs> being crammed in your brain? We we can kind of like take a look at this and say, yeah, I kind of get why particles are moving in these crazy paths because these are all the particles moving in the radiation belts, for example, and you can see they 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 gyrate meaning they, they spiral around magnetic field lines, they bounce from north to south and back again, and then they drift all the way around the Earth. And it's the magnetic, sh it's the magnetic field lines in particular L shells that allow that to happen. Does everyone remember L shells, hopefully? Um, so let me know, let me know if you, uh, uh oh, someone, someone's not being nice, RR2, mm -mm, come on. Be nice. Um, it's, it's, you know, be nice to people. Yeah, we've, I think we've had a little bit of, I, I've seen a little bit of rowdiness in the, in the um, comment section of the latest forecast. I think it's because that latest forecast I've, I put up has gotten more views than average because the sun is waking up. And so uh, there's, there's some people who are mad. There are people who don't really like it when I put out forecasts that are popular. Go figure. So we may be having a, a little bit of that raff in here right now. So I'm sorry, Jerry and Mike, uh, and anyone else in the chat who's having to deal with jerks. We're here to learn, guys. We're here to learn. And if my forecast is wrong or you don't like it, tell me that. Tell me you don't like it. That's fine. But don't be a jerk about it. I mean, geez. Give me a break. Besides, I'm just reporting NASA's forecast, <laughs> which could be very well wrong. We'll see. We'll see. We haven't gotten anything hitting us yet. It's sad. But we do have a couple solar storms on the way. We're just going to see whether or not they're going to all like scatter and off to the left, the east and the west of us instead of hit Earth. I'm praying we'll get at least one hitting Earth, please. But we'll find out. Anyway. So, okay. Do we need any review of the L shells or are we good? Okay. So, Alchemist Spirit, I said, I, you could use a brief refresher on the L shells. Okay. 
So I'll, I'll, let me give you a little brief, just a brief, 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 right? We're not going to do a big, oh gosh, let me, don't let me scare you by going through all that stuff again. Um, <clears throat> remember, L shells do drive current systems. But as a brief, I'll use this particular one because this is really useful. This is just a brief refresher, okay? So again, we're looking at magnetic field lines, right? So if you're looking at a dipole, and we're just looking at the simplistic aspect of the dipole field of the, of the Earth's magnetic field, okay? Because there's more than one set of components, but the dipole field is the main component. It's also the one that's flipping right now. So it's, it's making the news. Um, but it's shaped kind of like this. This is a very simplistic diagram, but dipole field typically has two lobes. You have the North Pole where all the field comes in. You have the South Pole where all the field comes out, okay, in the case of how our, dipole, our field is oriented right now. And the field goes out, I'm doing this right, out, goes up, and then all the way back in, okay, on both sides, both in, in you know, all the way around. So this becomes, oh, where's my slinky? Hold on, let me get my slinky. Yes, the slinky. Does everybody ha at home have one of these? If you don't, you need to get one. <laughs> no space weather physicist should be without their slinky, right? So, oops. Come on, Tam. So if you, if you can imagine, all right, I'm going to try to go straight out toward the, and get my hands out of the way. So you can kind of imagine if I were to take these loops, like these inner loops, and, and, oh, look at there, almost perfect, right? And extend them outward. This is what you're looking at, okay? So you can imagine this is kind of like a shell. If I were to paint or cover this, right? It would end up being a smooth shell instead of being just a bunch of field lines. That's what we're talking about when we talk about shells. And inside this, of course, if I were to unwrap this slinky, right? Try to get it aimed at you, right? You're seeing a, a jail. See how there's, you know, particles get stuck in here. This is how particle accelerators work, by the way. This is how the radiation belts of the Earth's magnetosphere get wound up during space weather events because you're making a toroid, if you look at it from the top down. But it sits like this, right? But each one of these little rings or shells has a name. The ones that are close to Earth, right, they're low L shells. So, like, you see that number two. See the two? Right, so I'm sitting at maybe, well, let me make it bigger so it looks like two, <laughs> Okay, so that, this way? No, this way. There. So I'm sitting at the two. Let me pull it back in. So now you see I'm, here I'm at a smaller L shell, right? So the closer I get to Earth, right, the, the lower number I have. L shells are simply the number of orbit, or the number of um, um, radii out from the Earth. So if there's Earth radii, that would be zero in a sense. You have one, here's two. It's not, like I said, it's not a great diagram, so it's not totally to scale. Three, L shell, L of three is out to here. L of four is out to here. This just means how many Earth orbits out are you? So L of four is four Earth radii out, okay? Always measured in the equator, because as you can tell in this coordinate system that what we call the magnetic coordinate system, L of four, for example, is only four Earth radii out here at the Earth, uh, out here at the equatorial plane, right, in the, at the equator. Um, or at least in the plane of the equator, right? Get my number, my finger. Because if you trace that field line in, well, this it, it changes how, I mean, look at here. Now it's clear down at Earth. It's not four Earth radii out now, it's touching the Earth's surface. So, but it's still L of four, okay? So that's why we define it out there is because an L shell, just because it says it's L of four, doesn't mean it's everywhere four Earth radii out. No, that's just one point of it, okay? But that's where we define it. But what happens is that you get particles, right, that are trapped on that L shell, and they're stuck there. They're stuck in that regime. They're stuck in that jail, right? They're stuck in that jail, and what ends up happening is that it defines how they move. Now, what's also cool is that L shells map down to the Earth's surface, okay? And that becomes really, really telling scientists are, are very bright because they realized since these magnetic field lines map, and I'm looking at TV so I can see where I'm pointing. That's what my head, I look like a headless monster right now. Um, but where the, where the field lines map right here, okay, we're seeing all that down up in this area. When we look at the map of the world. Okay, so those L shells, you can see L5432, 
da, 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 right, all the way down essentially to the magnetic equator. These are all where the contours, where those L shells map on the globe. And they bend because, believe it or not, the magnetic field of the Earth is actually tilted. And we'll talk more about that here in this class. But that's why you see it bend. Okay, and it causes, and that's one of the reasons why Aurora is more visible over the United States than it is over, let's say, Siberia for now, is because right now, L of, you know, to get to this area, you have to be at high L shells. But down here, you can actually be at lower L shells, I mean, at lower latitudes and still see those L shells. Up here, you have to be at really high, high latitudes to see those L shells. Okay, they're much higher. So you can actually get Aurora a little bit further south. When you're over, when you're in um, the United States, or when you're in um, Australia and Tasmania and New Zealand, because once again the L shells bend up, they go up north, which allows the aurora to come up toward you, just like it allows it to come south down toward the United States and Canada. So if you wondered why those guys get so lucky, that's why. Okay. Um, so one other thing about L shells that that you need to keep in mind is the fact. I stand back this way, that the way, if you notice, these are layers, right? And you might surmise that the lower layers are more protected because they're interior to the outer layers, right? So if you were a big space weather storm and you wanted to attack Earth, or I shouldn't say that, that's a terrible word to use. If you wanted to hit Earth and impact Earth, how about that? Then um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I just have to be so careful. There's so many people who are so scared right now because the sun is waking up. And so they're they're freaking out that, that you know, every little whistle and fart that the sun puts out is like a kill shot. And, and it's like, okay. So the word attack was really not a good word. <laughs> so I'm still, you know, going, don't do that. Don't do that. All right. Anyway, um, I know you guys know I'm silly. So... If a solar storm or you know a CME, a coronal mass ejection, ends up hitting Earth, it's going to hit from the outside in, right? So it's got to peel back this layer. So it's going to peel back the outer L shells first. So layer, you know, L of five, L of four, L of three, to, to be able to get down into this region. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure, you know, unless it's a Carrington class event, you're not going to see anything down at L of two and one. You just won't. I mean, th these areas are just so incredibly. Uh, well protected, that it's very difficult. You have to get a massive event to be able to peel the Earth's magnetosphere down that far, peel off that flux. And we talked about that. So if you need to go back and take a look at some of the dynamics, I think I even made like a stupid little dance. Um, I remember that now. In one of the classes about, because we were looking at the animation of how the Carrington event, for instance, we did a model of the Carrington event and you could actually see NASA did a great model. And you could actually watch how the flux was peeled back. And so you got down to literally like nothing in the front. The, the flux was, the, all, all the L shells, they were all gone. Um, pretty impressive. But you can also watch the flux come back. So it would, it would erode and then reconnect and erode and then reconnect. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, so what, and of course what that means of course is that down on Earth, if you have a solar storm working from the outside in, then you're going to get more disturbances at high L shells before you get disturbances at low L shells. So down here, it's going to be reasonably pristine. Up here, it's going to be a nightmare. And of course, we're not talking about EMPs. That's a different kind of phenomena, but that, that actually is really what low latitudes have to deal with uh, when a storm hits, especially if it's really impactful. It can cause EMPs. Okay. E3 EMPs, for those of you who know the difference which is the slow acting EMP. It does not rival anything that a, um, that a nuclear weapon could do, it's an, or lightning, okay? Those act much faster. Those are E1 and E2 class. Geomagnetic storm is E3 class, slow acting, but global. So, you know, walk softly, but carries a big stick, I guess is how, how you can say it. So they are, you know, that, that is important. Um, the, the EMP component of a geomagnetic storm that's big, a big bumper car, so to speak, can, can cause issues. And, and um, there have been Carrington class events that hit Earth. As a matter of fact, the one in 1972 caused a big EMP. Um, took out the grid in like four, four minutes or something. It was pretty insane. Anyway, so, so uh, back to normal storms and normal dynamics of the Earth's magnetic shield. Um, all of those L shells and all that govern particle movement, 
govern how how these things drift around Earth, govern really the kinds of environments that we see in different orbits at Earth. So you can start imagining that if you have satellites in different locations around the Earth's system, well, they're not going to encounter a homogeneous, you know, an even distribution of particles. They're going to encounter very specific things for very specific places, right? So it starts getting you to realize that, oh, okay, well, if I wanted to design an, uh, a mission that would last in low Earth orbit, well, I might have to design that to completely different design ideals or what we call specifications or what we also call requirements. Um, I'd have to design it to different specifications than I would if I had a geo, something in geosynchronous orbit, right? Because it might be totally different environments. And in fact, they are. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that, that gives enough of an explanation of, and a review of L shells so that we can begin to, and particle environments and stuff like that, so we can go on. Because we started talking last time really about orbits. Right, because I want to be able to get to in our and today I want to start going over how what how these particles end up affecting different regimes and different I mean re regimes, different uh, orbits, different environments, uh, in, in environmental spaces in different ways. Um, okay, good. Helen says yes. So I will start getting into that now, just a little bit. And yes, I do recall someone asked me on Patreon to go over a Molnaya orbit, so I will. Because I realized, oh my goodness, it doesn't have it here. <laughs> I was kind of stunned. So basic satellite types, and I did go over this before, so I'm just going to review again just by a little bit. You can do it by inclination, you can do it by shape, and you can do it by altitude. These are like the three main ways that you can, can um, talk about orbits, right? You, you can talk about when inclination, you say low, low inclination is essentially, is zero inclination is essentially sitting in the equatorial plane. Right, that's basically the, like the geographic equator of Earth stretched out into space. If you go into a super highly inclined, a 90 degree inclination, now you're at the opposite. You're so highly inclined that now you're just going over the poles. We call those polar orbits instead of equatorial orbits. Or you can have something that's kind of in the middle, right? And we typically call that an, you know, high inclination, low inclination. Obviously, high inclination is closer to polar. Low inclination is closer to equatorial orbit. And depending upon that inclination, you either graze through, you either dwell in radiation belts or you graze through them. You graze through what we call the horns of the radiation belts. So you can get a multitude of environments depending upon just what inclination you have. But you can also talk, uh, or, um, uh, order your or, or design your orbit based on its shape, right? So not all orbits have to be circular, right? You can have elliptical orbits. Right? And, you can, and, and you get highly elliptical orbits, which really stretch out, and they're very, very useful. And the reason why they're useful is because they zip through regions of that you're not interested in very fast. Right? So is it this way? Yeah. So you're zipping through what we call perigee, which is the closest approach. You zip through very quickly. But then when you come out here to the near apogee, you're moving really slowly. So you can dwell sometimes for days. And some of these orbits, for example, are really good for imagers when they're looking back down at the Earth. And you'll see, you'll see that. As a matter of fact, this is what a, a Malnaya orbit is. It's a type of or highly elliptical orbit. Some people call them high Earth orbits. Some people call them highly elliptical orbits. But they're always known as HEO. That's a HEO type. So you've got LEO, L-E-O, low Earth orbit. MEO, medium Earth orbit, and HEO, which is high Earth orbit or also highly elliptical orbit. Um, typically, high Earth orbits are not circular, typically. Um, and that's actually, I didn't realize, but that's exactly what we're talking about down here. Look at there. Okay, so by altitude, low Earth, medium Earth, and then a geosync. But they didn't go over the HEO, which I realized, oh, they looked at that as an elliptical, but it's also called HEO. Um, and even this chart didn't go over them, which surprised me. And I think I went over this stuff last last time too, right? So if I showed this, I, I do believe I did. I showed this to kind of give you just a little bit of numbers. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of variation depending upon where you know where you are. For example, uh, in a low Earth orbit here, they have a 160 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. You can't fly a satellite at 160 kilometers. I'm sorry. You're lucky to have it, you know, one last very long at 400. <laughs> um, 
most most stable orbits are are above 500 kilometers, maybe even 600 kilometers, um, depending. I mean, you get a lot of drag when you're down at 400, uh, and a good solar storm can puff out that that upper atmosphere and cause your your orbit to degrade very very quickly. So, 160 kilometers is more like where rockets are flown, where we do the, the rocket um, launches and and do those types of of um, sounding rocket um, research and out. You know, uh, projects, typically for things like the aurora and the ionosphere. Um, or we just go to Mars, because we can actually fly through the atmosphere at those altitudes and not have it be a problem. So that's actually where some ionospheric and, and um, uh, low Earth or low magnetospheric uh, studies are being done. They're realizing Mars actually might be very good for that, because we can understand a lot more, because we can actually fly orbits at uh, satellites at much lower orbit at Mars, because the atmosphere is so thin. But at any rate, you can see some numbers here. And obviously, like I said, with that type of range, there's quite a few different um, choices, right? You've got a lot of range. But that's a very specific environment that you have to deal with. Medium Earth orbit, you can see altitude of around 2,000 kilometers up to essentially geosync. That's what the 35 is. I mean, that's a little high. Um, but nonetheless, it gives you also a bit of a range. And obviously, your orbital period is going to get longer, right? So as you move further out from Earth, it takes longer to orbit Earth. And so you start getting things that are close to a day. Geosynchronous is obviously designed to be geosynchronous or geostationary. Um, they're slightly different, but not by much. A, geo, a geostationary orbit is a geosynchronous orbit. The only difference is, is that a geostationary orbit requires you to be at, at the equatorial plane because you are literally tracking. You're not moving at all. Your location, you could actually draw a, a, a straight line between yourself and some point on the Earth, and that line stays the same no matter where you are, no matter what time it is in your orbit, what time of day it is, it doesn't matter. Geosynchronous orbit has the same period as a, as a geostationary orbit. It's one day, but you could be inclined. So your track over, over the land will actually go up and down, right? So the line doesn't, you know, the line moves a little bit. So there's slight difference between these two, not a lot, but they got their own names for because they're used slightly differently. Um, and then a Molnaya. Now, I don't think I have it. Yeah, I think we went over this. I'm not going to go over this. This kind of puts things more into scale. I'll just mention it. Not even this one so much. And don't worry about all the letters. I know you can't read it. It's not a big deal. It's just kind of showing you how you stretch things out. But really, what for this class, what's important is this down here. Do you see that's the moon? <laughs> There's the moon. And if you can see the colors, so here's Earth. This is actually two scale. <laughs> I have to walk all the way over here. So there's Earth and there's low Earth orbit where that little line is. Really low. Mio, me, medium Earth orbit, is the green. Okay. Do I have that right? Yes. Heo is all this red. So you can see, and do I have do we even have geosynchronous orbit labeled? I don't think so. But it goes way out, as you can see. So and then you can see where the moon is. So you can kind of get an idea of where our, um, you know, where our, most of our satellites are and what the relative distances are. As you can see, Leo is much, much smaller than Mio, which is much, much smaller than Heo. Okay. And as far as I know, we're probably looking at geosync being right about where these letters are. Right here at the beginning of the red. Okay. Um, before I do that, and I think I've already done that once, let me do this. Come on. Let's not go there yet. Let me go to, yeah, I'll make this big. So because I've got the question about Mio, here we go, or I mean, uh, uh, Molnaya, here's an example, literally right off of Wikipedia, sad, isn't it? I actually went to Wikipedia to get something. Um, I shouldn't admit that, but oh well. <laughs> uh, here is an example of a Molnaya orbit. Okay, This is a Heo orbit. The reason why Molnaya and, and Heo is, are, are even distinguished, it's not. It's Molnaya is like a class of Heo. Uh, the reason why it's distinguishable at all is because the Molnaya orbit has a very specific um, inclination. It's about 60, 63 and a half degrees, I think 63.4. If I recall, and and there's a there's several reasons for it. Um, part of that is because you're really 
able to kind of have this long dwell time. If you notice, this is one of the, when I was talking about how you can have a long dwell time when you go slow through Apogee. Look how slow the, the, the things go through Apogee and then, then look how fast they swing through Perigee. They go whoosh and then over here they dwell. So it's really nice because these orbits, um, they're an alternative for, uh, for geosynchronous. You know, geosynchronous orbits are getting very um, crowded, let's say. And, and you're able, if, you if you're only interested in one hemisphere, for example, like the, let's say the Northern Hemisphere, you can dwell and stare at it for a long time. As a matter of fact, I think, do I have it? Yes, I do, right? Let me zoom out. There you are. I like this picture. Hopefully you can see that. So, so here is a view of a Molnaya orbit, really, and their imaging cone. So it's really good. It's one of the things that people use HEOs for. When you see HEO, the, almost the first thing you think of is either comms or image, right? Imagers, cameras, because they're really, really nice for that, that particular um, view, because you can almost see the entire hemisphere. So, so what's nice about that is that it views high latitudes in one hemisphere very well. Obviously, you zip by the other hemisphere way too fast for it to matter. Uh, so you only can be interested in one hemisphere with one spacecraft. But it, it is an alternative to a great degree um, for, for G, and then, you know, geo, because it allows you to, to still communicate with that hemisphere quite, quite well. Um, obviously not for low latency. You have, when you're that far out, you can be, you, you can be painful, but, um, you know, there's lots of different uses. So Molnaya is a very specific kind of orbit. So is Tundra. Tundra is another one that's also a considered a, an alternative for geo. Um, and both of those orbits do their best to try to avoid the radiation belts. And, and that's part of why the inclination is so high. Remember I told you that if, you, if you're sitting at low inclination, oftentimes you're gonna be dwelling in or around the radiation belts. The higher inclination you go, the less dwell time you have in those radiation belts, which is super important when you get out to orbits like this, right? Because you're now flipping through them, but you're flying through them reasonably fast. Um, and yes, humans could handle something like this. I don't know how many times around they'd be, they'd really want to live in something like this, but can humans fly through radiation belts? Sure. All the time, you know, cause it's, you only deal with it for a short period and then you're gone. Um, especially with the outer zone, it's really not, not a big deal. Remember the ISS has to go through the South Atlantic anomaly a lot. So sadly they get, they have to deal with it all the time. They go through radiation belts, um, quite often. So hopefully that answers the question. Oh, here's, yeah, I did this. Here's a tundra orbit for you. So if you're curious of what a tundra orbit is compared to a Molnaya, um, they actually make figure eights. Pretty cool, huh? So here's the Earth down here. And you can have tundra orbits that are further out. You're kind of like a big teardrop. That look, they look like the analemma, right, for the sun. Um, people go, oh, it's an analemma. No, 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 no. It's, it's, actually, it's actually a tundra orbit. <laughs> But there's all sorts of different types of orbits. So, and, and scientists and, and, and engineers are coming up with new orbits all the time. And I'll even talk to you a little bit about a tool. Um, those of you who are Bob or, or um, Scott Manley fans will appreciate me mentioning Spenviz. We'll, we'll even chat about that, I think, here shortly. So hopefully that answers the question of, of um, yeah, good, of satellite orbits. And, as we were beginning, as we were beginning to to discuss um, these different regimes, which we'll all, all you know go into a little bit, because I'll start talking about the effects of these things. Uh, I want to just kind of get you oriented, and I believe I, I talked about this last time, but I went over it really quickly. So this is the the coordinate system we've been looking at, right? This is real world essentially. You've got the Earth here, right, and then you've got low Earth orbit, which is this tiny area in green and greenish to yellowish. And then you start getting further out, you get into Mio, right, which is out in here. And you start seeing the effect of the radiation belts. You've got the radiation, we've got an inner zone in pink, you've got the outer zone in blue. And, um, and then you can see geosynchronous orbit right at the out, outer edge of the outer zone. And you can start seeing from this image, really, that you, you do these different regimes, or these different orbits go through different little microclimates, in a sense, microenvironments. And a LEO, something at low Earth orbit, like Starlink, is not going to be seeing a lot of the outer zone. <laughs> They're just not. 
Um, they may pass through the inner zone, which they, you know, could, depending upon what, what uh, inclination they're at. But they're not going to be passing much through, you know, something that the geosynchronous orbit would see, right? A lot of electron dose, for example. They'll be seeing proton dose, but not electron dose, and we'll talk about that. And then if you look at a high Earth orbit, you can imagine, well, it, high Earth orbit kind of goes through the whole gamut, doesn't it? Because you've got the, the perigee, which is way down here in many cases, not all, but in many cases, you have a very low perigee. So you can actually get really low and almost simulate for a short period what it would be like to be in a low Earth orbit or even a medium Earth orbit. But then you pass through possibly the radiation belts and you get way out here, you know, clear past them. And, and so... HEOs, highly elliptical orbits, especially if they're highly inclined, can really sample a lot of stuff. And so I unfolded all of that, right? That's, that's looking at things at how particles are organized in the Earth's magnetic field. And I flattened it out. Let's put it as just a map of, of uh, altitude, right? So we have altitude going up. Okay, we don't really have anything on this axis. I just kind of drew it, you know, as a nice plot so you could see. And if you look at it from this per particular perspective, at low altitude, you're going to have neutral particles, right? This is our atmosphere, right? And really, low Earth orbits can start in and around where neutral the neutral atmosphere quits and the, and the ionosphere begins. Um, this, is, this is really the regime of, of um, sounding rockets. But in this regime, right, this is where, this is why drag is such a problem. It's also why atomic oxygen erosion is such a problem for low Earth orbiting satellites. This is why we hope, this is why all the astronomers are praying that atomic oxygen erodes the shininess of the Starlink satellite so they stop giving so much glint and blinding them. And we have to wait to see whether that's going to happen because um, you need at least six months to a year before you start seeing those types of things. Sadly, it may actually work the opposite direction. It's hard to say because there's also charged particles up there and that could actually make things more shiny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all these competing processes, yes. At any rate, um, we're keeping our fingers crossed that it, it dulls the spacecraft instead of makes them shinier. But as you move up in altitude, right, you're going to get into the, into the um, you know, the, the charged particles are going to die off a bit. You're going to get into a lower density region, but now you're going to start getting into the radiation belts. They're not so dense, but they're more energetic, right? So now you're going to be dealing with, in MEO, you're going to be dealing with the inner zone, which is the pinkish stuff, and then the outer zone, which is the bluish stuff. And you're going to be dealing with all of that. So if you had a spacecraft, if I step out of the way, in high Earth orbit, for example, right, and I have it do its little thing, a little once around, you can see that what you're dealing with is a spacecraft that's going to sample a lot of different regimes, going clear down to the neutral atmosphere almost, at perigee and out at apogee, all the way through the radiation belts and beyond, okay? And then you've got, of course, one of the worst orbits, believe it or not, GPS is actually not a very nice orbit regime at all. As it goes around, it's almost dwelling constantly in the radiation uh, belts. It never leaves them. So you can imagine GPS satellites are built really tough <laughs> to handle really high energy particles. Um, and yeah, it's taken a long time to get really good at it. Um, there's, there's, there's been some real fun le lessons learned, let, let's put it that way. So I did go over this last time, hopefully this gives you a better feel for it. Where I stopped though, was when we talked about environment hazards, okay? And I'm sorry that this copyright doesn't come out very well, I just realized that it didn't come out very well. This is the Aerospace Corporation, so any of you who know where I'm from, right, this, this is a, a, this is... I've seen this picture. As a matter of fact, I put this picture on black. It used to be on white, and um, now I see it everywhere in black. I don't know why people didn't put it in black. It used to be on a white thing. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. It's got to be in black because sat satellites are in space. So now I've seen it everywhere in black, um, which is kind of cool. So I, I, I don't know if I, if I was the first one to do it or not, but it's kind of fun. Um, I love this, this particular slide because it shows really all the different types of microenvironments and what they what they end up doing to satellites. As a matter of fact, um, I'll start with this one because this is one of my favorites. This is this is um, a good friend of mine, Mike Mishiznik. Um, this was his lab that did this and uh, that did this testing. And it showed many, many, many years ago, um, 
he, as a matter of fact, he got the president's award for this, for the work he did on this. And it showed how a particular kind of, of thermal coating, this is a white paint called Tedlar, um, how it was beautiful when you use it in LEO, low earth orbit. And so some people wanted to consider using it in other orbits. Why not? Because space is space, right? Well, this is what happened to it if you put it in a geo orbit. Now, thermal coatings are meant to be white because they, re they reject heat, right? You get sunlight on them. They reflect all the sunlight in the EUV and all that kind of stuff. And so they keep things cool. What do you think what happens when something turns purple? <laughs> do you think it's quite as cool? <laughs> and then how about when it gets, co you know, it begins to cook itself and shred and fall off and flake off, right? Like you've seen the UV light here on Earth with paint jobs do. Yeah, this is what the radiation di dose did, okay, in GEO compared to LEO. So in LEO, it worked beautifully. In GEO, it, was, it would have been a disaster. And these are one of the lessons learned. Luckily, and this is one of the cool things about the company that I work for, is that, you know, this is what we do, right? We, we show, you know, and, and this, is, this is, you know, many, many, many years ago. So this has been published in many different places. So, um, you know, I feel safe sharing it with you guys. But these are the types of things that, that people like me who've worked behind the scenes, this is what we do. You know, anybody wants to think, oh, oh big brother, you guys are hiding stuff. No, we're not. We're testing stuff. <laughs> we're testing stuff, trying to figure out whether or not it's going to survive so that, you know, taxpayer dollars go to the right place and don't go to missions that fail. Right. This is what we do. This is this. This is no secret in that sense. So, um, yeah, this the, this is one of the things that radiation can do in the different radiation environments. If you don't have the right materials for the right job, you're going to you're going to mess up. And sadly, we keep thinking that we're teaching everybody these things and they'll go away and we'll, you know, they'll never have to learn the lesson again. And then we always have to reteach them because those people move on or retire or something and the new people come in and these old lessons are new again. So I, sadly, I'm not sure how long it's going to take us all to eventually get this under our, our you know, um, get this in the communal craw that, that these types of lessons are, everybody knows them, right? But we'll get there, especially as we become more spacefaring. So this is one thing, and this is just from surface degradation from radiation. In this case, it was electron dose, but you can get it from protons or, or um, other things. Here is, I'm sure you guys already know about this. Here is SOHO, right? This is the Lasko imager on SOHO. You can get false, you know, you can get blizzards, right? We talked about blizzards back in, in uh, when I was talking about solar radiation storms. So it, they can actually blind imagers. Now, that's bad enough if you're trying to, to detect a CME that's coming out to hit Earth, and now you can't see it because now you're in the middle of a blizzard. But how about a star tracker, right, that's trying to just simply know where it is? Because star trackers use stars at the, and the celestial sky to know its alignment. And so you get one of these events, and let's say you get a spurious, you know, command or something goes wrong. Now you need to use your star tracker to ensure that you're in the right orbit and, and that your alignment is correct and you can't see. So th these are these do pose problems, and these are again from energetic particles. Uh, solar, in this case, solar event, um, you know, solar radiation storms. Let's see. So on this side, we've got solar arrays. Sure enough, solar arrays can darken. The covered glass on these solar arrays can darken due to radiation damage, depending upon um, what types of coatings they have. And I'm not going to go into the details there, but it's like taking a sun, you know, suddenly having clear like transition lenses, right? You've seen those where you put the glasses on and they're clear, but you go out in the sun, they darken. Yeah. That's, <laughs> imagine having transition lenses on your solar arrays. It's great for you if you're walking out and wanting to be kind of, you know, be able to, to look out in the sun without squinting, but your solar arrays need power. <laughs> the last thing you want are sunglasses on your solar arrays, but that happens over time. There's been lots of lessons learned on that. Single event effects, we talk about, yeah, I've got it right here. Single event effects and microelectronics. Here you're seeing bit flips. That's what they're trying to show with this zero, the one going to a zero or zero going to a one. Um, this is because when you get particles that go through, uh, that, that are energetic enough, they will deposit charge. And that deposited charge can actually send a signal and be mistaken as a command. Oh, bit flip, memory flips. Oh my gosh, we have lots of that. And I'll show you examples of it. Um, you can actually have electron, let's see where I have it. Electronics degrading due to total radiation dose. So when you get, not just in your solar arrays, but you can actually have really penetrating particles. And when they go in there, again, they're depositing charge and you're getting past, not just on the surface anymore, you're now embedding 
charge in things like thermal blankets and and uh, wires even. Oh my gosh, you can actually do that even in wires. And you can actually, and I'll talk about it in a second, you can actually get discharges. But if you deposit charge in these things, what happens is that you you create noise. You raise, let's say, that the noise floor, in this case, the bias of a particular semiconductor or, or, or microelectronic. And and raising that bias makes it harder for it to, to get through the threshold, you know, having, you have to change then how it works. It, it degrades the performance because now it's not as sensitive. It can't reach voltages as low and, and you have to adjust things. So, you know, it just ends up over time killing something. This is why we have something called BOL, which is beginning of life and EOL, end of life, because you have this performance degra de degradation all the way through the lifetime of, let's say, some type of electronic circuit or even some, pop, you know, electronics box that belongs to a payload. Um, so that's that. And then of course, with the, you have these embedded charges, we'll just dump, we'll just jump right down to here. You can have an EMP, right? You can actually have an electromagnetic discharge. Actually, and it's the same thing that happens on the solar array, whoops, on this side. So these are kind of the two, two sides of the same coin. You can have a solar array discharge because often these solar arrays end up charging up dramatically. I mean, they're, Cap their whole job is to capture sunlight. Well, yeah, okay. That and the fact that they're big causes them to charge up quite a bit, not just the EUV side of things from the sunlight, but also just the radiation, um, surface radiation collecting. And, and you can have that kind of thing. And then if you have a discharge, if you have one side of it um, at a higher potential than another, well, then you can get a lightning bolt, essentially is what we're talking about. And that lightning bolt, believe it or not, can blow holes. <laughs> right through the solar arrays. And that we've seen that time and time again. So that type of thing happens. We're not talking about micrometeoroids here. We're talking about charging up from particles or charging up from, the, from um, EUV uh, and sometimes both. Sometimes the sun actually discharges part of um, the um, this stuff um, in a gentle fashion. We actually like it when things are lit because it causes photoionization. I think I talked about that in the past. If not, we'll talk about it today. But when you get these discharges, like you see here, um, if they happen inside the spacecraft, well, they can actually cause an EMP. You can get an electromagnetic pulse. And here's an example of an electromagnetic pulse. This one's something like four microseconds. And what you get, this is the potential, this is the induced, or so the, the voltage, the induced voltage. And what you actually get is you get this bing, and then you get an overshoot. So this thing wags very quickly, many times from positive to negative. Right, so you're getting this sadly an alternating kind of current here uh, that goes zzz, 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 and you get the ringing in the overshoot that lasts for uh, you know a certain period of time before it finally dies down. That can disrupt all sorts of circuits. So there's a whole host of different things that end up happening depending upon the environment you're in, and depending upon the view factor of something on your on your spacecraft. Things that are more protected are are protected against low energy stuff, but not protected against high energy stuff. Um, you know, things that are on the surface, like the solar arrays, have to deal with different and 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 uh, and thermal paints and optical thin films have to deal with different environment problems, uh, lower energy stuff, but higher doses, higher um, densities, I should say, higher fluxes of those things um, than something that's buried in a spacecraft. But the surface doesn't necessarily have to deal with an EMP nearly like like the internal parts of the spacecraft would, or buried charge. Oftentimes you can dissipate a lot of the charge that's on the surface, but you can't do it if it's embedded, right? If it's like crammed in you. So um, depending upon what environment you're in, your spacecraft is going to see lots of different things. And you really do have to make your spacecraft very robust to very different environments. Um, and it's, it's really hard to do, to make your spacecraft be some spacecraft that could go anywhere. Let me just let me just put it out there. If you were to try to build a spacecraft that could survive anywhere else, anywhere in the Earth's environment, man, that'd be an expensive spacecraft. So when missions change, and people say, "Well, let's fly this spacecraft over here," <laughs> most people in the know who are spacecraft designers or know the the environments, the space weather environments, go, "No, no, 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 no," because <laughs> it'll be an example like this, right? But we have to test, we have to start all over again. And this is where the concept of test as you fly came into play. And it's huge. The people who test as you fly know what they're doing. The people who don't oftentimes make mistakes, very costly mistakes. 
So that's why I'm actually super excited in, in the human spaceflight arena, because if you think of the human as just another one of these, but a lot softer, a lot more vulnerable than the spacecrafts are, right? We can't shield a human like we can shield spot shield spacecraft. Um, when I started seeing medical professionals testing as you fly, so they're doing like elders, low dose rates on humans for for radiation and just seeing or low dose rates on rats or whatever, you know, the, the poor living creatures that are dealing with it. But they're doing those types of tests where they're actually, instead of trying to use a proxy, they're actually using the real thing. This is the real environment specification. And so we're going to use that environment spe specification to do, to do reliable testing. I was just like, oh, yes, that's a whole new, you know, um, victory for human spaceflight because you just, you have to. You just have to. We've learned far too many lessons doing it the wrong way with spacecraft. Um, and I won't go into the details of that because I wouldn't even know where to begin. There's so many different ways you can mess this up. Um, but at least having the philosophy of test as you fly is the best way to go, irrespective of whether you're flying humans or you're flying, um, you know, robots or whatever else. Hopefully that, uh, that helps, you know, hopefully that clarifies some things as to how hard space is. As a matter of fact, Mike Mashiznik was the one who told me, uh, he says, space is hard. If space were easy, anybody would do it. So I've, I've always remembered that. And God love you, Mike. He retired just this week. Yeah, on Friday was his last day at aerospace. So 40 years, 40 years, pioneer, real pioneer in space radiation uh, analysis and testing. The guy's a legend. Um, okay, and a good friend of mine. So I will pause here for just a moment because I think what we're going to get into next are actually effects, right? Oh, right. I could go into spend this. Yeah, we're going to start. We're going to almost get into effects. Yeah, we're going to start talking a little bit about substorms and then go into that. So, um, but I'll pause here. See if anybody has any questions before we move on. Um, Wonder how SpaceX Starship will be on radio will be radiation hardened. SpaceX works very closely with aerospace as well as others. Uh, I don't. They're not. They're not being cavalier when it comes to this kind of stuff. The issue, of course, is just where where they're going to <laughs> where they're going to set their thresholds. Um, you know that 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 I think is still a, a a point of debate and and to a great degree, you know, astronauts. Astronaut safety has been set for NASA. Astronaut safety has been set uh, by NASA and by the SHRAG, the Space Radiation Analysis Group. And I'm not sure if those thresholds and things like that are going to change. I mean, there's, there was a National Academies of Science, or National Academy Science of Science. I, forget. I, I always, I'm dyslexic, so I get things backwards. But you know what I'm talking about, that, that, that national group that has just recently put out a, an article about changing the radiation thresholds for males and females and normalizing it, making it the same. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. If you do it, do it by body weight, please. Um, you know, if you really don't wanna, if you really wanna degenderize the, the whole radiation um, dose thing to, to make it more equitable uh, for both males and females, okay, fine. But please dose, at least do it by body weight because, um, you know, have some level of, of, of understanding that, that a human is not a human is not a human um, when it comes to radiation. It's, radiation is non-intuitive. So uh, I think there will be some changes up soon, but I'm not sure to what degree uh, those changes will be, will be in play uh, by the time we want to start launching people in, you know, to art, with, in the Artis, Artemis mission or, um, you know, even going to Mars. Not sure about that, and I'm not sure how how that plays out with Elon's, you know, designs. I'm not sure he's going to be held to the same standard or or not. If it's a NASA mission, yes, I imagine so, but I'm not sure if it's private, right? Because he's now doing private flights as well. I really don't know. Um, that some of these millionaires may be just signing their signing waivers, saying I do it at my own risk, and I'll just take whatever dose I get. Uh, I, I just don't know the, the details of that. So it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. Um, what other questions? Let's see. Any influence on Tama that has... Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that, Susie Cat. 
Do you know if any new instruments are looking at the EUV wavelength of the sun like Eve did in the last solar cycle? Oh, I, you know, I, that's a very good question. I don't know. I probably should catch up on some of the proposals that have been uh, submitted recently. I don't know if anyone is looking at EUV. That'd be a really good question for one of my solar physics friends. We always lament not having enough imagers uh, like Eve uh, out there and um, um, Iris is a good, another good one. Uh, and, and there's been, and Hino, I mean, we have, we do have Hanodi, I know that, but we, but there are, there are lots of different ways we want to look at the sun in, in lots of different wavelengths. And uh, we just, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these imagers are extremely expensive. I think right now, a lot of us are, are really wanting to get the L5 mission up um, just to, so we can even have a far-sighted view of the sun again, um, even in the wavelengths we know so well. So I, I don't know, I would think that, that that may be a higher push, at least on the European side of the house. So I, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure when another imager like Eve is going to be up. Um, what is, oh, okay, that's, that's not a question for me. Good, okay. Let's see, any other questions on this, guys? I keep seeing conversations about hemp. <laughs> Hemp in space. Does it grow in space? I don't know. The ISS should grow hemp. That would be funny. Boy, that would be a little tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Um, I think that's it. How does... Okay, here's another... Wait, is that another one? How does one get into the solar science space weather reporting industry? Ha! Huh, there isn't one yet. Uh, that's that's the field we're trying to create. Uh, there, very, there are jobs that come out... Um, but there are not a lot of them yet. I mean, basically, the, the jobs that exist in space, whether like some kind of broadcasting that isn't in academia, will be either working in engineering, you know, building space missions um, and building the spacecraft, like what I'm talking about here, uh, or it's working, let's say, at the Space Weather Prediction Center or at some of the other budding space agencies all over the world. I know SANSA is, is being stood up, for example, in the South African um, um, you know, in, in, in South Africa, that as a matter of fact, I was chatting with Marty the other day about it. And there are, there, there's st he's standing up his team now. So there are new space weather operating agencies that are, that are being built all around the world slowly, but surely, but yet the getting, you know, finding the jobs is, is still a little bit on the thin side, but I, I'm, I do believe that the public side of space weather is going to take over soon. Um, and that's gonna be a whole different class of people. And likely meteorologists um, will end up being a large part of that. We'll probably start seeing terrestrial meteorologists first um, with space weather miners and space weather uh, expertise being able to step into those shoes uh, prior to actually having people from academia, space science, heliophysics, academia, move down into these more operational and engineering environments. Um, so if you're interested in getting into that kind of thing, uh, I would I would begin, if, if you really like the idea of weather broadcasting and space weather broadcasting, then I would really look at the AMS and I would look at the space weather side of that and look at um, go, maybe going into, terrest into terrestrial meteorology, ionospheric physics, and then maybe moving into space weather from that perspective, instead of starting at the PhD level in space, in heliophysics, and doing all of that from an academic side, because there's really, right now, there's not a lot of movement in that direction. There's a lot of movement from the other direction up. Neutral atmosphere up, not from space weather down, if that makes any sense. Uh, and, and that's just the way it is. Um, okay. Let's see, how will SpaceX protect astronauts from cosmic rays? They won't, they won't. It's extremely difficult. Um, and it's not even just a matter of protecting astronauts from cosmic rays on the interplanetary journey. Remember when they get to Mars, for example, cosmic rays penetrate all the way to the ground at Mars. It's not like Earth. Earth, our atmosphere is thick enough to protect us. But Curiosity Rover and, and um, a few others have taught us a lot about space weather, uh, inclement space weather at Mars. It's it's much much more harsh environment. So there's a lot of stuff that is unresolved. Let's just put it. We're working on it, but it's unresolved. And the, but the thing is, the the astronauts know that they've got to deal with it. They they you know anybody who goes to Mars is not sitting there saying, oh we'll be fine, we'll be wonderful. I'll just use an umbrella. No no no. They they know 
they know very well that that radiation can be tough and um, but they're willing to take the risk right I mean all all astronauts have a very pioneering spirit and they know risk is part of the I mean that's that's inherent in the job so I think we're going to learn a lot from Artemis um, because basically the moon believe it or not the moon is far more is far closer and from a space weather perspective it's far closer to Mars than Earth is so as we have a lunar colony on the moon, we're going to understand a lot of the issues that, that space weather will bring at Mars because the radiation, once again, will penetrate all the way to the ground. We may have a neutron albedo like we do on the moon. We may have that at Mars as well. Um, there's, there's all, you know, living underground or having to, to run underground, finding underground, you know, fissure, fissures and, and uh, lava tubes um, is, is a huge thing. Uh, both at Mars and at the Moon. As a matter of fact, there's a um, there's a fantastic program, and I'll just go ahead and talk about it right now, called Spacebit. If you guys aren't familiar with the company Spacebit, you should. Um, it's a UK program, and they are actually going to be on the Artemis mission. They are going. They're little spider rovers. Anybody who loves David Bowie will love this because these are the spiders that will eventually go to Mars. If you want to know what his band looked like, here it is. <laughs> Um, they are little micro rovers that are running around with legs. And the reason why they have legs as opposed to wheels is because they want their purpose is to go look and, and dig in, in lava tubes to see if it can be a habitat for humans um, because to protect them from the radiation environment and protect them from space weather. And so that's one of the space weather is one of the main focuses of their of their entire mission. And I think and I'm and I'm just so thrilled because they're like one of the few that actually have made that a primary part of their mission. It's not just some adjunct, you know, oh, we're going to take cool pictures of the moon and play golf. And no, no, no. Their point is, okay, space weather sucks and we're going to take it seriously. So that's their whole thing. And so if you haven't checked out Space Bit, you really should. It's an excellent company. Um, I've talked to the CEO personally and uh, he's a really great guy. Um, and, um, and really their whole team is, is very, very cool. So I'm very enamored with them. Um, and again, I, obviously I'm biased, but it's because they're taking space weather seriously and they wanna make sure that, that we have a good time on, on the moon and eventually on Mars. And it's, um, it's just a really great, really great thing. So I'm gonna be following them quite closely. You'll probably start seeing some of that stuff in my forecast from time to time. I'll give you updates on what Spacebit is doing. So hopefully that answers that question. That was a really lengthy answer, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Spiders on Mars, right? Exactly. You got it, Susie. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions, guys? Because otherwise I'll get back to this. This was one of my nice little breaks, right? When I take these Q&A breaks, it's a good time to kind of stretch your legs and go get, you know, go to the bathroom or get food or, you know, just know that you can come back later. Um, so, I'll, and I'll take breaks like this again, you know, throughout the course. Are they still trying to get stereo B? Oh gosh, I don't know. I haven't talked to Janet Lumen recently. I should ask. I can't imagine they're not. Um, has anyone checked the DSN network to see whether or not they're still trying to ping stereo B? That's a great way to check, is to go to the DSN. Um, um, I mean, they've got it online, who, who they're, who, what, what all the dishes, who all the dishes are talking to in the network. And every now and again, you'll see them trying to contact stereo B. So I don't know if that's officially over or if they're going to keep trying even as Stereo B comes in front of Earth. I'm sure they'll, they will try again, but man, um, it's, it's sad. I think one of the, you know, one, uh, last I heard, one of the gyros was completely failed. So even if they, even if they were able to contact it, whether they could resurrect it or not, is, is, um, it's pretty slim to none. Okay. Um, how thick of a water jacket is needed to help protect from solar and cosmic radiation? Um, it depends upon it depends upon the the you know the it really it depends upon the energy energy of the particles. It depends upon the species of the particles. It depends upon uh, what flux levels you consider acceptable for how long. Uh, it that that is not a trivial answer. And there's 17,000 different answers. Well, not that many, but there's a lot of different answers depending upon what your thresholds are. I mean, some people have said that you need a swimming pool. <laughs> you need, in order to shield yourself down to zero, you need a, a, a you know an eight foot radius of water around you. 
Um, other people say, well, we can tolerate a higher dose rate than that. So, you know, they begin to thin out the amount of, of uh, water required. It's just, a, it's just an extremely non-trivial problem to solve. We'll never get down to zero. There's always going to be some level of, of risk. I mean, the most energetic particles will pass right through these, the entire spacecraft in like this. We've seen it. Um, even you know the high energy GCR and of course the ACR the the, the anomalous or the light, or anomalous cosmic rays the ACR will absolutely do this, but um, GCR will pass through these these things and we've we've seen it in in um, especially in scintillation counters we've seen it many times in some of the uh, astrophysical uh, experiments. So Chandra, for example. Um, okay. Is there a special connection between the Earth and the Sun that causes Earth-facing quiet? No, no, not at all. Uh, we, we've done statistical studies. It, it ends up. Remember, the Sun rotates in every 24 days from the Earth's perspective. It rotates every 27 days because the Earth is chasing it in its in its orbit. So um, we're we're seeing a new face of the Sun all the time, and and so the Sun really doesn't. You know, there's, there, it, it's not that it calms it down just simply because it's got the Earth influence. Uh, when we've done statistical analyses on, on space weather events, it's pretty even over the course of the solar cycle. It's pretty evenly spread all, all 360 degrees around the sun. Just sometimes it just seems unfair. <laughs> it seems like, wait, all the, all, the, all the solar storms recently have been farsighted. What's going on? No, 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 there's, there's nothing going on. It's, it just, it's just, you know, how many times can you flip heads? I don't know, for the quarter. Um, okay, guys, looks like I've gotten a decent amount of questions, um, and, and I will, uh, we will, we can try again a little bit later. All right, so what I'm going to do, just, just for those of you who've ever watched Scott Manley or other, um, actually, let me take this back out, uh, other astrophysics or physics, um, YouTubers. I remember the first time I saw Manley pull up SpinViz, I was like, what? You know about SpinViz? As we were just talking about that other slide where we're, we're dealing with all of this stuff, I thought I would just mention to you, you know, I probably gave you more information than you wanted to know when it came to all the different microenvironments. And believe it or not, we actually have, because of all of the lessons learned we've gotten, we actually have specifications. We've actually learned a lot about these how to deal with all these different types of things. And so depending upon the orbit and, and mission that you want, the mission life, the mission orbit, the, the, the design, you know, the, the, the performance that you need um, with all the different payloads you have on there. And yeah, I guess I should just say the miss, mission objective, right? Um, you will have different requirements set for your mission. And one of the great ways to get the space weather st side of things is to go to SpinViz. Okay, and the reason why I've got this down is because I'm going to actually go to the website here for a sec. Whoops, no, that, yeah, okay, I did that right. Um, where is it? So I was talking about Molnaya, so I'll put that back up here. I can probably kill the Molnaya stuff now. And let's go to the beginning of SpinViz. Okay, so here's that SpinViz sign-in page. Um, it's, this is a neat engineering tool because, and yes, you do have to register, you do have to get an account. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's an amazing resource for engineers. And there are so many models and they're adding models every day and updating models. And what's really cool is that they've got help files. And those help files link to all of the academic articles that, that were from the scientists who actually created the models in the first place. And then you get to see how those models are transitioned from academia, from research into operations. So an R2O kind of thing. This is a perfect, to me, this is like one of the best examples of an R2O environment in the sense that, that when you look at research going into operations and how scientists actually do make a difference in our everyday lives or make a difference when it comes to space environments and, and space missions, this is how it happens is that you get these, these scientists who study particular environments or study particular phenomena, and then they make models to try to, to replicate that phenomena under certain conditions. And then those models, if they're robust enough and are proven over decades typically, well, yeah, yeah, after you think about it, decades. Enlil, I remember Dushan working on Enlil back in 1998 and 
right, uh, it took more than a decade for him to be then brought into the Space Weather Prediction Center as Enlil, right? That's our solar storm prediction model that everybody uses all around the world now. But I remember when Dushan was making that model. <laughs> um, so, sorry, good memories. I was a grad student, so that tells you how, how old I, you know, how long ago it was. Um, anyway, you actually do. So anybody who thinks that scientists really don't don't do anything but just push paper and 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 you know go to conferences and play play around, there really are um, real uses for what scientists do. We don't just kind of do this for fun. There are there are real impacts that we have. So if you ever get a a thing in Spinviz, and I'm not going to go into it in super detail, but you will find that in Spinviz there's just so much stuff. Um, you have things, as you can see, I, I created a temporary uh, model here, or a temporary package here. Um, and this is, you've got things like coordinate generators. I can open it. And inside a coordinate generator, you can actually, this is where you actually can design your orbits, okay? So, I mean, I don't know if I, I just kind of ran something simple. Um, I'll zoom this in. You can use orbit generators to create things. You talk about them, and I'm not going to go into the details about it. You have to talk about your mission duration. You can talk about whether you have like different segments in your mission that might be different. You then can talk about orientation. You go into um, talking about things like radiation pressure. This is this is from um, solar wind. This is atmospheric drag from low Earth orbit. Remember, we were talking about low Earth orbit things. You can account for these things because there are different models that have to do with it. And if you go and you and you just you run stuff, look at all this cool stuff. Okay, I mean this is this is serious. You've got different types of orbits. I don't know what do you have up in here? Hyperbolic, geostationary. Oh my gosh, uh, near Earth in planetary two line element. I mean you you can define your own orbits. Um, and heliosynchronous. So it's not even just around Earth. You can go around. You can also change planets, by the way, and go to a different planet if you want. You can talk about calendar date, and then you can add in all this stuff. Okay, now I'm not going to go into it because it gets very, very complicated very quickly. Obviously, you know things like perigee and apogee. We talked about that. But you could also go into the right ascension of the, the right, um, the, the, is it right ascension of the ascending node? I forget, but argument of perigee, true anomaly, there's all sorts of it. Yes, yeah, so the longitude, or you could, you could define it in terms of longitude, right? Ascension of the ascending node, all this astronomical stuff. And then you can even adjust how, how many, um, you know, what resolution you need for a particular orbit period or orbit part, segment of your orbit. Remember we were talking about with HEO orbits, for instance, you fly through perigee very, very quickly. Well, you might want to up your resolution at low altitudes because you fly through it really fast, you're not gonna get a really good line through your orbit track. But where it's really slow out at apogee, well, you don't necessarily need a high resolution because you're not moving very fast. So you can lower your orbit resolution. Spin does even takes into account that kind of thing, okay? So again, I'm not gonna go through all this because it's just so deep, but that's for one thing. And then if I go back here, that's for coordinate generators, okay? Oh yeah, look, switch to another planet, see that? <laughs> So it's not just for Earth. Then look at all these models. Radiation sources, spacecraft charging, atmosphere and ionosphere, magnetic field, meteoroids and debris, miscellaneous, GEANT-4. GEANT-4 is a, a very big particle pushing um, tool that does cosmic ray showers, for example, and gives you secondaries. It basically looks at how, how you can take an ionization track and put it through even through semiconductors, right? Through an atmosphere, through a semiconductor, and see what happens to these things. And then you have other, other types of standards. Every single one of these, like for instance, if I go to radiation sources, look at all this stuff, okay? All of these will break out into even more stuff, higher and higher, I mean, well, more and more detailed um, information. So you get trapped proton and electron, that's the radiation belts, okay? Solar particles, those are the radiation storms, right? Galactic cosmic ray, well, we know what galactic cosmic rays are. You have all sorts of different models for this stuff. I mean, even trapped proton and electron fluxes, for example, you have standard models, but then you have things like Irene, um, which is AEP9, essentially, SHREM and other things. You can even define your own if you want. If you go to trapped, I mean, if you go to the standard models, here's a AE and AP8. You can also do CREAM, SAMPEX, which was a mission that lasted 20 years that aerospace flew. As a matter of fact, anybody know? <laughs> A in AE 
in the AE models, which you see here, AE8, AP8, or AE9, AP9, you know what the A stands for? Aerospace. So the Aerospace Corporation has done this for decades upon decades. I mean, we were we were one of the standards, and now we're one of now the models that we create are the standard models for radiation dose, for trapped radiation dose. So if you ever see the word Aerospace Corporation when it comes to um, radiation specifications, you're pretty much on it. And don't worry, Paula Bryan, I'm not going to talk about the details. So just know that the A that that uh, this is still the standard, the AE8, but or an AP8, but there are AE9 and AP9 uh, models as well. Um, but again, if I were to go and look at specifics, you could find models that go into solar cell radiation damage. So you, it takes these, it takes the solar radiation, um, it, it takes the particle radiation and slams it through a a solar cell. And you can define, is it silicon, is it aluminum? What, what, what kind of, you know, do you, is it a two five pi view factor? Is it a four pi view factor? You can get so lost in the minutia if you don't know what you're doing. But if you ever wanted to know how engineers do what they do, it's not, well, it is rocket science. <laughs> this is rocket science. This is what you're looking at, okay? But it's not scary. It's not, it may be a little overwhelming, but it's not hidden. You can get, you can get an account, right? So anybody who thinks that this stuff is hidden, it's not. Anybody who thinks that scientists are trying to hide this stuff from you, we're not. It's all available. Even Scott Manley uses it. I mean, for goodness sake. So you can get access to all of this. You can do your own analysis if you're willing to learn. And here's the cool thing. SpinViz has tons and tons and tons of help files. Whoops. This is the help file. If you go to help, you get table of contents. Look at all this stuff. You can click, if I click on any of these, you can get information and information and information. Every single one of these are links. Some of them will do links straight to the, the papers that started them. They'll talk, to, they'll talk to you about where to get this information, how they all work, who created it in the very beginning. Look at all these links, okay? And they don't just list it. They talk to you about it. So for those who are not afraid of this type of thing, I encourage you, go look, go look, go learn. Right? Learn as much or as little as you want. SpinViz is fantastic in that sense. It's one of the best databases I've ever seen when it comes to environment specification for engineers. And, and yes, it's heavy duty, but it's not hidden. It's very much in the open. And it's very much for anyone who's willing to dive into it. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about SpinViz. Um, but yes, you can get an account if you want one. All right. I will get off my soapbox now regarding that. But I just, you guys know me well enough to know I get upset when people say, oh, you scientists, you all are hiding stuff. You're working for the government and you never tell us anything. You never share anything with us. How about that? This is where all the engineers go. All right. I even use SpinViz. I've used it many times in my work. All right. Um, even Scott Manley uses it. I know, funny, huh? <laughs> but I mean, you know, and he's a YouTuber, for goodness sake. He's an ed educated one, but he's he's a YouTuber, right? But that's the same tools that, that people are using who design missions, serious missions, multi-billion dollar missions. And you can use it too. Okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, out, about the uh, outer radiation belt, because that's the one that everybody always talks about. This is the one that everybody gets scared about, because we've got a lot of spacecraft in. in um, as a matter of fact, before I do that, let me remind everyone, right? Radiation belts. We have two radiation belts. I'll go ahead and play it. Usually, two. Oh, I can't play it. That's right. I forgot. I have to. The media is not found. Uh, I'm not going to play it. You guys already saw this last time. <laughs> um, but we haven't, and you can't really see it all that well because this, this this frame isn't all that great. But we have two radiation belts. We have one in the inner zone. This one is mainly protons, and then we tend typically, and you're seeing in this case three radiation belts. But oh well, we'll talk about that in a sec. This is essentially the outer zone, outer in here, and it does extend from about L of four out to L of six, typically. 
Um, geosynchronous is uh, 6.6 RE. So as you can see, the L shell, we're talking about L shell. So geosynchronous is just outside the frame of here. Um, and you can actually get a lot of electron dose, um, especially um, surface charging due to all the electrons out here in the outer fringe of the outer zone where geosynchronous is. But in this case, you know, space weather events can often cause you to have more than two radiation belts. Sometimes you'll hear people discover a third radiation belt. We've discovered it like 10,000 times by now. Um, they happen all the time, as you can see, even in this data from SAMPEX, um, here's a temporary third radiation belt. Um, and, and I've talked about all this, and you could see it in the last, I think, probably, probably the last course in M2. You could see this, I, I think this is when I ran this. I may have ran it even in the first course. But just to remind you, the outer zone, we call the outer radiation belt the outer zone. Um, you, you'll see that interchanged, those phrases interchanged. That's mainly electrons, not all, but mainly energetic electrons. And then the inner zone, right in here, this is mainly protons, okay? Some electrons, but mainly protons. Again, energetic particles. So, re so relativistic, okay? So let's focus on the outer zone for a second. The main hazards in the outer zone are things like surface charging and internal charging, okay? These are caused by electrons that up to about 30 keV, right? These are thousands of volts, right? Well, 30 keV up to thousands of volts, so a couple thousand keV. Yeah, 2 MeV flux, for example, which is 2,000 um, um, keV. Uh, you, this is where when you look at the Space Weather Prediction Center and it shows the 2 MeV flux, and they have a flux level, they have this threshold, that's where satellite orbit uh, operators in, for geo orbits, they worry. Once that flux reaches a certain height, a certain amount, they start worrying about getting uh, surface charging and potentially internal charging because uh, those fluxes, once they get that high, then you can get a lot of electrons sitting all over the surface of the spacecraft as well as ones that penetrate inside and they start charging up the spacecraft and you can get lots of spurious things happening like what we talked about on that other slide, okay? These happen, surface charging typically happens during magnetic substorms, which we'll talk about soon. Within the plasma sheet, which is an environment very close, do you guys remember the last course we talked about the plasma sphere? Yes, within the plasma sheet, you're passing through the equatorial region that is kind of an extension of that. And then, of course, in the auroral zone, you're getting lots of particles being shot down the, the, the pipe, you know, at the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And those particles, as they get shot down, some of them can be extremely, um, can be energetic enough to cause surface charging. So... Um, the problem that we oftentimes have when we design spacecraft is that these charge you will get discharges that you know those EMPs right they'll get those those breakdowns that with the lightning bolts will happen when you have dissimilar materials that charge up differently so you get the same amount of environment but in one you have a conductor and one you have an insulator and the insulator ends up being charged more and the conductor doesn't so now you have a potential difference between the two and you'll get a discharge. So that will happen, or if you have um, the satellite frame, or, or you know, if, if you have different dissimilar metals, materials in a payload compared to the satellite frame, um, or you are, let's say, in sunlight versus sh shadow at that terminator, if you don't have a satellite that spins, oftentimes the sun will be able to, to, um, to um, do photoelectron, photoionization, and, and kind of bring down your charge level and bring down your potential, whereas the side that's in shadow stays charged. And so the difference between if, you're, if your satellite is just staying in a single, um, it's not rotating and, and being able to, to, to have the, the part that was in shade move into the sun and then, you know, so it can also, you know, um, um, discharge, that's the word I was looking for, discharge those, those charges, then you'll end up getting a, a potential difference set up between the shadowed part and the, and the sunlit part, and you can get an arc right across that. That's why a lot of spacecraft are spinners. Internal charging happens with particles that are a little bit more energetic, um, greater than 300 keV. And this is again, because they have to ha have enough energy to penetrate right through the metal in, into the electronic boxes or in the wires or in the thermal blankets or wherever they end up going. This um, typically happens uh, several days after big, 
bigger magnetic storms. And the reason for that is that slinky effect. Remember, we talked about the slinky, right? This, turn it like this, and it is a particle accelerator. Zip, 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 zip. So it can take those lower energy particles and accelerate them, give them more energy. And they go around and around and around, and they get to higher energies, right? So you increase the flux of higher energy stuff, but it takes a couple days for that to happen. And that's why when you look at Space Weather Prediction Center page and you see that 2 MeV electron flux, typically when a space weather storm is happening, you don't see it. But watch it after a couple days. And watch that flux start rising. That's what they're talking about, and that's when they're worried about it. So if you ever look at the Space Weather Prediction Center page and you look at C's, for example, the, the alert for, um, for radiation um, and in geo, and you look at the radiation clock, sometimes I will show it in my forecast, you'll see that there's a spot for surface charging and one for internal charging because they're slightly different. Here's what I was talking about with uh, sunlight. Sunlight can discharge, right, as we talk about it. In sunlight, you can get photoelectrons, right? So you can get, there's lots of different sources. You can get an incident electron, um, you can get an incident ion, that's the red, and then it kicks out a secondary, um, a secondary ion. Or, but you can also get the, the photoelectron, I mean the, the um, EUV, the um, um, incident, um, boy, I'm just short on my words today, the incident photon coming in, and that will actually liberate an electron, okay? So you can get current, the I is for current, and so we're talking about where you're getting sources of current coming in and where you're getting sources of current leaving. And in the sunlight, you actually can get this extra discharge from photoelectron, the photoelectron effect. But you don't get that in shadow. And because of that, what ends up happening is that you do set up a potential difference between your sunlit side and your shadowed side. And if you don't have a spinner, meaning a spacecraft that's spinning and constantly changing its view factor to the sun, then you can build up that, that potential difference quite dramatically. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at the bullets. Did I cover it all? It also means charging will be worse in shadow. Yeah, I covered it all. So even just not even not even looking at anything else other than just what your view factor is to the sun can actually create a space weather microclimate for you. Kind of freaky, huh? And we have to take care, take into account all these things in, in all the analyses and all the um, um, engineering that we do for spacecraft and missions. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about substorms. Any of you who are Aurora chasers will know substorms are a big deal, right? Most people think, oh, you don't care about space weather unless it's a big storm. You got to be KP of five. No, you don't. Depends upon the latitude you're at. Because substorms, which can happen at KP of two, which is actually one of the reasons why I was so excited about these storms that are hopefully going to hit sometime over the next day or two, um, is because even if they're mild, if you're at high latitudes, you have a good chance for substorms. And of course, if there's substorm physicists out there, don't, don't shoot me. Yes, I know they don't have to be triggered by the solar wind, but it helps if they've got some solar wind stuff going on. So there's, there's always been an argument about do substorms are, can substorms be triggered by solar wind events? Um, to a great degree, substorms can happen anytime. And they're really just an internal reconfiguration of the Earth's magnetic field. We call it dipolarization. I know I've talked about it before. And they're like bigger storms, but they're just small. <laughs> the, the reconnection, the, the changes of, and the reconfiguration of the Earth's magnetic field just doesn't happen on a grand scale. And so they don't necessarily last all that long. They don't have to. But they still can shoot those particles down into the Earth's upper atmosphere and cause aurora. But they also have another role to play. And that is that they, um, they are, can be real hazards for spacecraft. And the sad thing is that they can be hazards for spacecraft when we're not looking for space weather, when the space weather is otherwise very quiet. Because like I said, they can be their internal reconfigurations of the Earth's magnetic field. So they don't have to be triggered by anything. Meaning there may not be a warning. And that's one of the sad things that, we, that we're still trying to understand about space weather, right? And it's one of the reasons why magnetospheric physics is still such a big deal. Um, we don't fully understand when and where. Uh, well, we know more about where, but we know a lot less about when substorms will happen. But the neat thing about substorms is that they always, they are, they are, um, they're methodical. They always happen in a particular way. 
So the particles are typically injected, as you know, as I've told you in the past, right? We have particles that come up from the tail. Remember the slingshot? Same thing in substorms. You have a reconfiguration of the Earth's magnetic tail. It dipolarizes, which means it stops being so stretched out and becomes more like a dipole field again. And so it slingshots particles from the tail up toward the Earth's, you know, basically what we call the plasma pause, which is where the plasma sphere starts. See, I should be able to use these terms with you now without it totally throwing you off. So the particles come up here, but as they get closer in and the magnetic field gets um, you know, stronger, the particles then, oh, oh, and I forgot to tell you, I'm looking down at the Earth, down at the Earth from the North Pole. Okay, sorry about that. So here's the night side, but we're looking down at the Earth from the North Pole. And what you're and, and obviously the sun is over there. Oh, the sun is over here. <laughs> the sun is me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm mirrored. So, um, yeah, my head is hold, hiding noon. See noon? Okay. So this way, but we're looking down at the sun or down at the earth from the North Pole. The tail, the, the particles are coming up the tail. But the neat thing is that if you're an electron, as you start sensing the magnetic field um, closer in, that magnetic field is actually going to dictate which direction you travel and which direction you drift. Remember the, the, what we call the third adiabatic invariant, the drift motion, right? We got, we got the gyro motion, which is the spiraling around. We got the bounce motion, that the particles bounce up and down, right, back and forth, and mirror it at the, the mirror points. And then we've got the drift, where it drifts all the way around the Earth. Well, depending upon which orientation, or I mean, excuse me, which charge you have, if you're an electron or a proton, right? If you're an electron, you're negatively charged. If you're a proton, you're positively charged. Protons, I mean, will drift around the Earth from from dusk to dawn this way. In this, in this, um, what am I doing here? Am I going to get that wrong? Clockwise fashion? Am I correct? <laughs> from my from my perspective, it's clockwise. Um, and then electrons. So they'll electrons will drift as they come up the tail. They'll actually drift to the dawn side, and that's counterclockwise, unless I'm completely stupid. Um, and that always happens. So if you if you were looking at particles coming, you would always expect the electrons from this big bulk, what we call a bursty bulk flow. This is a high dense, highly dense pocket of electrons, let's say, coming at you. You would always expect that highly dense pocket to kind of drift off to the dawn side. And the same thing with protons, the positively charged stuff, you would expect the highly dense pocket to drift off to the dusk side. So where do you think, if you're going to get charging, because charging happens mainly from, um, and more quickly, with electrons, where do you think you're going to see a large part of the charging happen, right, from substorms? You're going to get it on the dawn side. And sure enough, if you look down at this plot, that's exactly what you see. This is GOES-5, GOES-4, and 5. So each blank dot represents a surface charging anomaly from GOES-4 or 5. Okay, so these are in geosynchronous orbit, right? And it's the same plot as this. You're looking up the tail, right? Here's the sun. You're looking above the North Pole down at Earth, okay? And each one of these dots is representing some kind of anomaly due to a surface charging from low energy particles, low energy electrons. And look where they're all focused. Look where they're all, you know, you see very few over here, right? They're almost all happening on the dawn side. Substorms, electrons. Okay, so you do get surface charging anomalies, even in geo, from substorms. Okay, and it happens when, you know, anytime, really, anytime you have substorms. So it's a very important part of, um, and I'll get to that in a sec. It's a very important part of space weather, but it's not a very predictable part. And it actually happens, believe it or not, not just at GEO, it happens down at GPS orbits and even down lower, because they actually have to worry about it in, uh, with the ISS as well. Here's another example, same thing, I've kind of put it in the same order. Now you don't really see the, um, the Earth anymore, but you can see the L shells. See that, two, three, four, all the way up to 10. 12 over here is, is noon. This is now local or magnetic time. 12 o'clock, so noon, right? Zero local time, that's midnight. So again, the tail is on that side. And what you're looking at here from Fennel et al., good, good colleague of mine, is these are observations from a HEO spacecraft. 
Okay, remember HEO goes way out and then back in, way out and back in. So it penetrates in all sorts of different L shells. But every single pe uh, uh, anomaly it had, it had, you know, and, and the different colors are basically the inbound and outbound kind of thing. It's, it's the max or min L that it happened. But as you can see, a lot of it happened very much on the dawn side, right? All where the electrons are. Some of it happened on the other side a little bit, right, from protons. But a lot of it happened with the electrons. And why does it stop? Well, because as these particles drift around the Earth, they get smeared out. There's lots of wave processes. Remember, we talked about waves and stuff. It begins to smear those, those distributions out so they're not so dense. So the chant, because with particles have to happen in numbers. It's like kind of like having ant stings or bee stings, right? One bee sting, not so bad. A uh, hundred bee stings, eh, okay, you're in trouble. Thousand bee stings, you could be in the hospital almost dead. Same thing with satellites. Think of the electrons as bee stings, right? One or two, no big deal. A thousand, <laughs> right? You may be really taking that satellite out. So as you begin to disperse those bees around, you know, using wave processes to, you know, the brooms, <laughs> you're batting the bees away, right? And you're dispersing them, then they become less of a problem for your satellites. Well, that's a weird analogy, but hopefully it works. So that's the thing about substorms, okay? Now, that, and that's also talking about the main issue of like things like surface charging and internal charging. That's where electrons really get you, okay? Um, and uh, hopefully that helps, that, that, that's clear enough. One of the other things that we've actually talked about is total ionization dose or total ionizing radiation dose, TID. Um, this is probably the most well understood of all of the radiation um, specifications, dangers, hazards because it's an integrated effect and it's one of the first ones we recognized when we started doing space missions. Um, this is an effect of like, imagine having your bee stings, not just that one substorm, but over your entire life, right? And you're adding them up over time. And this is where things like beginning of life and end of life really begin to work together, where you start seeing the degradation of your performance over time. So you can imagine this was one of the first things we recognized when we started doing space missions. So to this day, total ionizing dose specification is a huge part of spacecraft missions because it causes so many things, right? You can get degradation and failure of the electronic devices and solar cells. You can actually, oh, and I didn't even talk about that, but you can actually induce radioactivity because if you have heavy ions, for example, and they slam into your, to your materials, you can actually have near, you know, nuclear reactions, nuclear collisions, um, where it, which isn't really a super, you know, isn't really a head-on collision, but it's close enough. You get so close within the cross section that it, you will actually split the nucleus of another atom, and 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 shoot out um, daughter products that actually are radioactive uh, isotopes. So you can actually induce radioactivity depending if you're if you're talking about heavies, and that typically happens in the inner zone with the um, with the heavier ions, the and, and the ACR and the GCR they get trapped there because you have much heavier ions in the inner zone. The outer zone again is mostly electrons. Electrons can't do that. They can't induce radioactivity nearly as well. But over time, that can be a real problem for you, especially if that in, in interferes with your mission. Um, Obviously, the degradation of surface materials, I, I talked about Tedlar, for example, damage to human cells. Boy, we know that one, um, especially in the inner zone when, when you're dealing with um, um, those heavies and going through the South Atlantic anomaly. So we already know the primary source of the radiation dose is trapped radiation belts, uh, particles, right? But you can also get it from solar proton events. And here's just for your reference, if you're interested, um, how you can can translate it from, you know, things that we talk about in RADS when we talk about spacecraft uh, dose and silicon dose and microelectronics dose, we talk about it in RADS, but you also can talk about it in grays. And um, you can also even talk about it in sieverts. And sieverts is something that is used in aviation quite a bit. Grays are used in medical um, and it has to do with the tissue. Um, human tissue has different dose um, characteristics so it's normalized in a different way. So grays will change depending upon the material, the human material that you're using. Isn't that terrible? I'm talking about a human like they're a satellite, um, which is different than RADS and again, different than sieverts. Oh, 
do I not want to be someone who has to keep all that straight? It, it to me, it sounds like a big headache, and and I'm afraid one day I'm going to be forced to do that. <laughs> but but uh, you know, especially as space weather gets, we get more into this spacefaring thing with human beings. I think we're all going to have to learn how to do that better. Um, here is a, I, I, this is almost for historical reasons. This is a very old image of total ionizing, total radiation dose. Um, and I'm talking about ionizing as opposed to non-ionizing. The non-ionizing is the stuff where you actually get collisions and actually can do serious damage. Ionizing is just simply having an electron track or a particle track through your, um, through whatever material you're dealing with and you're not creating um, you're creating electron hole pairs. You're not actually embedding particles into your um, into your device, and you're not creating daughter products like big cosmic ray showers and things like that inside your your um, material. That is non-ionizing, and that's much more damaging. You actually destroy the lattice of the material that you're the chemical lattice of the material that you're in when you do non-ionizing radiation. Totally different kind, but we're talking about ionizing radiation dose. Uh, so as you can see here, this is from back in 1996, I believe. Yeah, it is. Um, this is a specification. So you can see what a lot of old specifications look like. So here is typically, here's, here's one done with the altitude. In, this, are, this is a, a logarithmic scale going from 100 kilometers up to, you know, past geosynchronous orbit. And then here is the, in this case, they're talking about annual dose. So this is an integrated dose. We're not talking about days. We're not talking about hours. We're not talking about minutes. We're talking about years, okay? And that's when you talk about total ionizing dose or total radiation dose, that's typically what you look at. You'll look at maybe even over a mission lifetime. I've looked at what the mission lifetime 10-year dose would be or even 25 years for an extended mission. Um, and you start looking at very large numbers, obviously. But you can see for a, a total uh, radiation dose, you're going to be talking about both electrons and protons. You're gonna be talking about things like bremsstrahlung. And yes, SpinBiz does do all this if you want it to. It will talk about bremsstrahlung. It will create these secondary um, and X-ray radiation and, and, and add that to your total dose measurement if you want it to. And you can see that if you're at LEO orbits over here, look how radically different your environment looks, right? Mostly protons. But if you get out to geostationary, you're going to be dealing with mostly electrons. Okay? And you can get anywhere in between. And so you have to deal with things like, you know, where are you going to radiation harden your, your parts? Or can you do commercial parts, you know, in, in your spacecraft? Here we're not even talking about, we're not even adding in the cosmic rays necessarily. We're talking, this, this may just only have to do, have... Um, uh, let's see, shield dose AE8 max, AP8 max. Yeah, it probably does. We're not doing cream, but it has it has that. It may have the the galactic cosmic rays in there, but we're not. I don't see anything in here that's showing solar energetic particle events. So that would be another model that you'd have to lay on top of this to add even more to it. It gets very complicated very fast. But I wanted to show you that an, an old version of of a plot that is using AE8 and AP8 from clear back in 1996. And this is what a specification looks like. <laughs> Interesting, huh? So you really have to design your mission and know what your orbit is, know what your function is, know what, what whether you're dealing with imagers or whether you're dealing with comms, you have a big radar dish, you have um, star trackers or you're using gyroscopes or you know, you've got lots of, of things that get hot and you have to worry about your thermal paints degrading. What, what are all these? This is all called the trade space. And so this can be extremely complicated and extremely problematic. And that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about in terms of that. Now we're going to get into some better cool stuff. Okay. Everybody wants to know what the South Atlantic anomaly is. Oh, my goodness. It's just the inner zone, really, believe it or not. And how does that work? Well, let me see if I stand on this side. Believe it or not, the inner zone. And here, here so this is the Earth, right? We're looking, obviously. And the Earth's geographic axis is straight up and down that's north and south geo you know from a geographic point of view and the earth is rotating right around that axis well the magnetic axis of earth is tilted relative to the geographic axis okay they're slightly off which means those gorgeous radiation belts that we always show just completely flat completely in you know 
straight, right? And the equatorial plane is all perfect. Relative to the geographic axis of Earth, that's not true. The radiation belts are tilted. <laughs> so it, depending upon how the Earth is rotating, you'll see what it looks like is the, 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 um, the radiation belts look like they wobble <laughs> back and forth as, as the Earth rotates around because you, you have this magnetic axis that's you know, wobbling relative to the Earth's geographic axis. But what that, where that's a real consequence, other than being cute, where that's a real consequence is when it comes to the inner zone. And so you can see these two green little high, you know, enhanced regions. Those are cartoons of the Earth's radiation belts. And we're talking about the inner zone. Notice here that the inner zone in this side, which is actually near South America, is actually tilted in because you've got that tilted, right? So it actually, at this tip over here, the southern tip, it's actually tilted in toward Earth at lower altitudes in our atmosphere than the other side. Okay? So by tilting the Earth's magnetic field, you're actually bringing that inner zone in a little bit closer to Earth's upper atmosphere than it otherwise would be if it were straight, if it were symmetric. So every single time a low Earth orbiting satellite, which tries to fly in this region, whoops, tries to fly in this region, <laughs> flies over South America, they actually clip the inner part of this inner zone. That's the South Atlantic anomaly. You're actually flying through the radiation belt. And this thing can be measured clear down to like two to 300 kilometers. You actually get particles that are kind of raining. And the funny thing is, if you really look at it, and this is what's really cool, if you look for where the biggest source of lightning is in the world, the number of lightning strikes at the maximum per day, every day of the year, right? Compared to where the, all the thunderstorms are. And we're talking about in the equatorial region because that's where all the thunderstorms are, right? You're not gonna have a lot of lightning in Alaska necessarily because you're not getting as many storms up there. But in the equatorial region where you have all these thunderstorms and you have tons and tons of lightning, where is the place that has the most lightning in the world? South America. <laughs> really close to the SAA. Hmm, maybe there's a connection. Yeah, penetrating particles, penetrating particles. It's causing a lot of electrons, a lot of, a lot of energetic particles in there, more ionization. Could it be seeding lightning? Might be a neat research project, don't you think, for a, a terrestrial meteorologist looking to go into ionospheric physics, looking to go into space weather? Nice little link. Seems pretty easy to me, but I think it's a little bit more than just a coincidence that this Lake Manitubo, or I forget the name of the lake, but there's a lake that's literally sitting just above this region that is where all the lightning, the, the biggest coincidence of lightning, or the biggest incidence of lightning occurs on the planet. I don't think it's a coincidence. Anyway, um, okay. Uh, so that's the source of energetic part of, um, of the South Atlantic anomaly is really energetic particles from the inner zone. Now we can talk a little bit about CRAND processes. I don't really want to talk about CRAND. I don't think it's super relevant um, to us. That's a probably a little bit more than we need to know. But you can look up CRAND processes, which is basically um, particles that are coming in GCR or even ACR that's coming in. And then what happens is that it ends up interacting with, um, with neutral particles coming out of the upper atmosphere. And then you get charge exchange, and so now you can actually trap particles um, and, and, and liberate neutrons and, and these types of things. And you get these decay products that end up being trapped inside the, the inner zone, which helps to replenish um, the, the electrons and protons, the energetic electrons and protons in the inner zone. So it's called cosmic ray albedo neutron, oops, over here, cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. I'm not going to go into it in, in any deep depth, but I guess I can't talk about the inner zone without at least mentioning it so you guys can look it up on your own. But really what I wanted to talk about more was about the location of the SAA. And I'm also, I'm just putting this up more for your um, benefit. I'm not gonna go into these uh, incredibly in, incredible detail. I've already talked about them to some degree. I talked a little bit about what ionizi you know, ionizing radiation is compared to non-ionizing radiation. Um, this is really just a, of making a track 
in in you know an electron hole pair track through let's say a semi um, conductor some some type of device it's really not disturbing the lattice too much whereas a nuclear interaction or a non a ionizing radiation uh, is usually from a very heavy ion so not typically protons something bigger and um, and and we have a ton of them in the inner zone I mean there's there's somebody could probably argue that there's even you know there's lead and gold and all sorts of other things because we get that from solar radiation part. You know, we get, we get that from our solar wind. So we can actually get that stuff here too. I don't see any reason why not. So we have really heavies. They're very low fluxes, but they have heavies. And these particles can just rip through and actually hit other particles inside the materials and actually just, you know, cause radioactivity and all sorts of other things to, to be, um, to occur. It's pretty, really small uh, probability that that happens, but it does happen. It says only one in 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth ions will interact in this type of way. But um, typically, if there's a possibility for direct ionization, so an ionization loss, that, that process will win because it's easier. It's energetically more favorable. Uh, but it, these types of things do happen. And that is how you can induce things like radioactivity and really do bad things like latch up and just, just totally destroy a circuit. Um, and this type of stuff happens all the time. So here's where the fun, the fun part is that these are called, these types of things are called single event effects. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, a lot of people, the more common way of talking about it is, is SEU, single event upsets. But believe it or not, single event upsets are really a subset of single event effects because you can have an upset that is um, destructive or non-destructive. So a single event upset that is not destructive is let's say a memory bit flip. Um, or a calm bus try, like you try to communicate and it gets scrambled. And so you just try again until you get through. Um, a, a memory bit flip will occur if you have a, a zero and one, right? You have your binary pair and then you get a, a spurious, you know, signal and it changes a, a, a zero to a one. And so now your memory is messed up, right? But that isn't necessarily a catastrophic failure. In some instances, catastrophic failures um, in these types of single event effects can be, um, or upsets that are unrecoverable. You can get things like um, latch ups where, and some latch ups are recoverable. You get something where it, it, it you get a, a spurious um, signal that causes a, 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 let's say an ASIC or a or FPGA, a, a brain of a computer to go into a particular state and it can't recover, it can't change. It stays in that state and it's latched up in that state. Sometimes powering down and repowering up will change that, will reset it and be fine, non-destructive. Other latch ups, however, you can't reset them. They're stuck and they will cause a burnout because that latch up will stay like that. And it will continue, perhaps, let's say it opens a circuit and then suddenly you get you know, a short and it just it fries whatever, whatever circuit it's, it's connected to. Or how about this one? <laughs> How about a spurious command that says, turn on this booster, turn on this thruster, right? Or, you know, make this momentum dump. And suddenly your spacecraft now is getting this command to move. And, oh, Lord, you know, now that could be unrecoverable. So there are different types of single event effects that could be recoverable or non-recoverable as the case, you know, depending upon what it is that got upset. So here's a bunch of examples of single event upsets in the, in the South Atlantic anomaly. You can see in this example for, you know, obviously all the dots, look where they, look where they cluster. They cluster here. <laughs> Wonder why, right, going through the South Atlantic anomaly. They also cluster to a great degree, as you can see, both at high latitudes. Anybody know why that happens? So they can cluster at high latitudes. What precipitates what gets shot down into the upper atmosphere, right? Remember, we talked about substorms. We talked about particles coming in from the tail. Remember, we talked about aurora, right? You're going to get particles. What, what causes aurora? Well, electron, the electrons, you know, you get elect, electrons, particles being shot down, electron particles, electron beams being shot down into the upper atmosphere. Those low energy electrons, though, right, they light up the, the atmosphere like a, you know, like a beer sign, but they also can cause on their way in, they can also cause surface charging and internal charging. And those can actually cause tri uh, uh, issues as well. So in this case, this is the UOSAT memory upsets. These are only bit flips, recoverable, right? 
So they just had to clear the memory, start again, clear the memory, start again. What a pain in the butt all the time. Guess what? This is a normal day in space. <laughs> Satellite operators have to deal with this all the time. And a lot of times we end up having mitigating circumstances where we, we rewrite software to cope with these types of things. It's like we put the satellite up and, oh my gosh, it's malfunctioning. What do we do? Well, let's first find out what the malfunction is and secondly, see if we can mitigate through. And that's really the name of the game when it comes to space weather. Nothing works perfectly. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The key is, can we mitigate through it? And this is where I want space weather, even on the ground and reporting of space weather to change. It's not about making us foolproof to space weather. It's about mitigating it and making it workable just like we do with terrestrial weather. We can't make weather go away, right? But we can mitigate the impacts of rainstorms and hurricanes to a great degree. So we work through the issues. And that is really the, the key to surviving and the key to becoming a spacefaring race is being better at mitigating and being able to work through the problems because we're not gonna protect ourselves from all of them. It's just not possible. It's too many, right? Here's another example. So this is Sampex, my, one of my favorite spacecraft, Sampex, because it sampled lots of different L shells and it was a particle, um, mainly for particle radiation. This was, an, again, an aerospace mission. You get a theme here that maybe aerospace is in the, jo in the, is in the business of protecting satellites? <laughs> yeah, right, that's, that, that's the whole reason why aerospace was stood up um, and why we have such a big SpaceX wing, if you're, if you're curious. Uh, again, look at where they cluster, right? South Atlantic Anomaly. Right. Now, bus retries, this is just simply telemetry, trying to, to get access, trying to talk to the spacecraft. Right. So it's, it's doing bus retries over and over and over again. But you see them scattered all over, but you see them clustered again, high latitudes and definitely in the South Atlantic anomaly. OK. How about in NASA? Look at ISS. Or no, no this is NASA shuttle. This is a. Shuttle missions, STS 37, 39, 43, and 44. Look at them all. Again, can you tell where the South Atlantic anomaly is? <laughs> so anybody who thinks that radiation isn't a problem in, in, in where the ISS is, um, you are dead wrong. And again, we got it all over, right? But over here in the South Atlantic anomaly, these are due mainly to protons and heavies from the inner zone. Up here, these are due mainly to electrons. Okay, from being precipitated in from either the radiation belts or from the tail. Okay, you can see that. So it's not, space is not space is not space. It really matters where you are in space and what's coming at you from what L shell. On top of that, we have solar energetic particles from solar radiation storms. You guys might see this. Actually, let me show you one more. Hold on. That's right. I wanted to show you this. Thank you, Seth Claude Pierre. I was looking at something the other day. Um, oh yeah, right, I forgot to show you this. Yeah, I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, do, do, do. do I not have that up? I thought I had that up, but I'll show it to you. Let's see, oh, I do have Twitter. No, that's Santa. Shoot, I have to look him up. Hold on a sec. So, Seth in space. Um, Seth is a, a colleague of mine. I haven't talked to him in a while. Really good guy if you don't follow him. He's a very savvy space weather um, radiation belt person. Um, he used to work at aerospace. I think he still does, but works also in other places now. But I was looking at something and I ran into something he had done. So I, I just checked him out on, on Twitter for just a second. And he had just retweeted back on the 25th. He had retweeted this really cool tweet from Zafar, who, a person I don't know. And it's because he, he picked, perk my ears because obviously, or my eyes rather, because of the South Atlantic anomaly, right? I'm just thinking, okay, I got this class I'm gonna give tomorrow. What, what is this about? I said, maybe there's something cool. So he's just talking about the, the Van Allen radiation belts and then he talked about Hubble. And I went, oh yeah, Hubble's in low earth orbit. That would be, that's an interesting thing to, to see. And he says, the telescope gets bombarded with energetic particles usually comprising, usually compromising observations. I went, right, it's an imager, right? Remember how we talked about with solar energetic particles from the sun blinding SOHO, the LASCO coronagraph in SOHO. Well, why wouldn't the South Atlantic anomaly blind Hubble, right? 
same kind of thing. These are solar energy, not solar energetic particles necessarily, but they're trapped. They're the same type. They're protons. So let's, I said, okay, well, let's take a look. So what he had to show was first the South Atlantic anomaly, right? So you can see it in this neat little passage and you can see the, some of the, I think these are, and, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know them very well, but what these look like is maybe guidance or not guidance, but, um, um, uh, measurements of, of the different particle fluxes from these different regions or just observations of the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, so you can kind of see the scope and the width and the, the, the location of it from these different um, passes of these different missions. Um, so that's why it's slightly bigger or smaller, depending probably depending upon the height, the altitude of the actual spacecraft that flew through it. I, I don't know. I, 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 but just know that the, this is obviously a contour of, of the, the South Atlantic anomaly. And of course, the Hubble Space Telescope track goes right through it. See that? So you can see where that is. And here's, and I forget if it's this, I think this is the beginning of the track, and it goes through the middle, and then out the other side, or vice versa. I forget which way it's going. <laughs> Pardon me. But um, it says H8, the Hubble Space Telescope, once every minute. So if you look really closely, you can actually see the minutes written on the actual track of the, of the Hubble. But you can actually see... Um, obviously, it goes right through the heart of the SAA, right? If you go into the middle, you can see. So I thought, oh, this will be interesting. What does this look like? Huh. It says, cutouts of the darks. So, he's so this is the Hubble Space Telescope taking pictures of the dark sky, okay? At the beginning of the pass, of that pass we just saw, and in the middle. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Do you think Hubble can take pictures of anything when, when it's in the South Atlantic anomaly? This was something I never appreciated, was that once every orbit, if it's passing through the South Atlantic anomaly, Hubble is blind. I mean, totally blind. Do you think an astronaut would want to be out on an, on e, on an EVA having to service Hubble in this mess? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, no. <laughs> no thanks. Not, not something. But this is real world, right? And you don't really hear much about this side of space weather, right? You don't hear this much. Have you ever heard of this with Hubble Space Telescope, that it gets blinded anytime it goes through the SAA? Hubble's been around for ages. And, and I mean, I remember Hubble being operational when I was a grad student. I've never heard this before today or before yesterday when I saw this. So I thought I just wanted to share that with you, that that was just something that I found um, thanks to Seth's timeline. So thank you, Seth. That was very cool. Uh, and thank you, obviously, Zafar. Uh, much appreciated. So, okay, so enough of that. Anyway, all right. So I'll show you one other thing, and then we're getting really close to the end here. But I wanted to show you this, too. I was also looking at, this was a, um, a PowerPoint um, that was done by Evans and, was it Richard Thorne? I forget. Danny Summers, Ian Mann, Daniel Baker, and Michael Schultz. They were just giving a quick brief uh, about, and these are all radiation belt physicists, um, Mike Schultz. I just chatted with Mike Schultz just the other day, actually. Um, the most challenging consequences of Earth's space environment occur in the inner radi in the inner zone. Okay, if you say so. And I, I had found it because I had actually saw this a picture of, you know, the same picture. See, it's in black. <laughs> I was like, I never saw this picture in black before I put it. I made it black, so be cute if I if I actually m motivated other people to make that picture black, but instead of having it on a white slide. Notice it's the only black slide in this entire deck. <laughs> anyway, that just tickles me. Um, I am an artist first and then a scientist. And when I saw that the slide was in white, I'm like, why? It's in space. There's there's no white in space. <laughs> Should put a star field out on there. Yeah. Anyhow, I'm just being silly. Okay, one thing I really liked about this particular slide was that if I can get it all in, oh yeah, duh, put it in presentation mode. Oh, poop, it did that, okay, oh well. I'll see if I can point, it, it flipped the thing on me, so I don't have a good picture of it on my own screen. But um, what I liked about this slide was that it showed kind of, as you can see, here's, go over here, here's supposed to be the earth, it looks like it's a little distorted, um, but what they've done is they kind of stretched out, or the inner to outer zone to kind of match this, this nice plot. And what I liked about this plot is that they've got, um, not only do they have things that you should know, for instance now, HEO orbits, 
GPS orbits, where the geo orbit is in relationship to, um, um, you know, to, to the different types of hazards that you see. But you can also, and, and you can see where Van Allen probes were, that, that was a huge mission. Once again, um, aerospace flew some really heavy duty instruments like MAGICE on this mission and got a lot of information about the radiation belts. But you can see Van Allen probes covered a lot of L shells, okay? So this is, um, and here they're showing down here, they're, they're showing it in magnetic uh, latitude, um, but you know, in, in Leo orbit, but um, so from zero degrees all the way up to 90, I think 90 degrees, let's say 90 degrees. Oh, 69 degrees, because by 69 degrees, you're basically out of the horns of the radiation belts. So um, you're really dealing with, these are people, again, who look at the radiation belts. So that's one of the reasons why the Molnaya orbits are so useful is because you're up at 63 and a half, I believe. And so you're almost out of the edge of the, the radiation belts. You're barely clipping them. But once you get to about 70 degrees inclination, you no longer experience the radiation belts because you're too high. Your orbit is too high. So... Um, you know, it's too highly inclined. But what's neat about this is that you can see where a lot of single event effects happens, SEUs, right? Single event upsets in this case, but it's SEEs, really. When you, type, when you see SEUs used in a general sense, think single event effects, because there's all sorts of different kinds. Um, but you see a ton of them, right, down in here. And this is at low Earth orbit. And the reason why, in low and low latitude, low Earth orbit. So low inclination, right, because you're down here at low degrees, low magnetic latitude, because you're dealing with the inner zone and you're dealing with that single of the, that South Atlantic anomaly. So tons of SEUs. This is where the ISS resides. They're not at high, they're not at high inclination, right? They're mid inclination. I think they're actually they're maybe at 55 or 59. So they don't have as many, but imagine if they were really sitting here and dwelling in it all the time. Yuck, right? So I think the ISS is somewhere up in here. I forget if it's 55 or I, I forget where it is. Um, my fault. I probably should know, but I just don't pay attention um, to the human missions. <laughs> I really need to. <laughs> Shame on me. I know. Um, okay. Internal charging, though, right? We talked about internal charging. Well, that begins to kind of peak everywhere in terms of latitude, right? Up from zero to all the way to, to 69 degrees. And the reason for that is because you have electrons everywhere, right? You don't have as many quite in the inner zone, right? but you do have them. And then they extend all the way through because the, the outer zone is very much dispersed, right? But where do you get the highest densities of, um, of the electrons for surface charging? The lowest energy plasmas, that's where, because you're not getting internal charging, so you're not penetrating, you're talking about the lowest energy stuff. That's where you get the highest densities of, of, of low energy stuff that or highest densities of electrons is always in the lowest energies. And that's always what causes surface charging. But believe it or not, surface charging hazard actually causes two thirds of all the anomalies in geo. And this is why. Look how much surface charging you get at the average geosynchronous latitude. Okay, that's because you're sitting in the outer zone dwelling. So I really like this kind of plot because it had a neat kind of feel for where it had a different kind of feel for showing you how different orbit regimes, both in latitude and in, in um, orbit location, what you sample, what you deal with, how you have these microclimates, so to speak, in near Earth space. And this is just for the trap radiation population. We're not even talking about um, the, the solar particle events. So as we step into the solar particle events, you can see here, here's a plot from 1996 to 2010. And you can see particle events, these are protons. These are all protons now from the solar radiation storms. Now we've talked about solar radiation storms when we talked about solar phenomena, but you can see starting from here, from about 1998, oops, let me get my hand in the right place, till about 2007, you were just slammed by these very fast, very momentary zip high flux events. Okay, because these are protons per day. See this protons per day? So they don't last long, just a couple days. But man, you get these high fluxes, right? This is a whole new animal when it comes to particle, you know, radiation dose. You can really up a radiation dose um, very, very quickly when you get solar radiation storms, and especially at geo. 
they, they, they really penetrate. They don't penetrate quite so far into like really low earth orbits, but at geo, you get the full shebang. And sure enough, here's GOES, which is in a geosynchronous orbit, right? This is GOES greater than 30 MeV solar protons. And you watch it for just one event. Okay, this is, whoops, over here. This is one event. The proton flux goes up, okay? And I can't remember if this is like an S2 radiation storm, S3 radiation storm, I can't remember. But um, you see it, you know, flattening out and then slowly dying down over the course of several days. Because this is day of year 196, 197, 198. So those are days. Okay, so the solar radiation flux stays, or uh, pr uh, particle radiation flux stays really high for several days, this period. See all these little things here, these little triangles? These are all single event upsets on GOES during this particular proton event. This was called the Bastille Day. I just realized that. It's the 14th and 15th of July 2000. This was the Bastille Day event. This was a ground level event, actually. Um, these particles, these energetic particles from the sun were so, so energetic, they made it all the way to the ground. We, we detected them in neutron monitors. So this was a, not a small event. Um, oh yeah, it says Bastille Day behind me. <laughs> Bastille Day radiation storm. So solar event effects, I mean, solar energetic particle events cause single event effects as well. So you've got all those trapped radiation things to think of. You've got protons to think of, electrons to think of, so substorm stuff to think of, auroral precipitation to think of, solar energetic particle things to think of. And it's like, can you imagine how busy spacecraft designers are? So here is a summary of radiation belt particle things. I like this because it kind of put it all in a nutshell. We have the slot region that supposedly list, exists prior, you know, between, whoops, am I, am I doing that right? Sorry, slot region is over here. Slot region that exists su supposedly between the inner zone and the outer zone doesn't really exist, <laughs> but, and mainly because it gets filled by multi MeV electrons. Remember how we saw inner, the, in, the inner, I mean, the um, internal charging, how that was everywhere? Yeah, the slot gets filled. So anybody who thinks that you can fly in the slot is, is fooling themselves. These um, radiation belts fill up all the time. And so there's really no, no such thing as a safe place. But the nice thing is that it kind of gets this inner belt, you know, so you can see what, what particular uh, microclimates, so to speak, you get with radiation. Very intense protons, um, possible electron belts sometimes, heavy uh, ions, right? You can get galactic cosmic rays and solar particle uh, um, events being trapped, you know, the, the, the heavy ions being trapped in there. And, uh, and obviously this, the, sing, the South Atlantic anomaly, right? That's what you get when you're Leo. In the outer zone, you get long-term electron dose effects, surface charging and deep dielectric charging, which is the internal charging aspect. There's also something called hybrid charging, which is kind of both at the same time. There's all sorts of different, very complicated specifications that go into this. So even though it seems like space should be space should be space, and it spaces a vacuum and spaces, you know, the only thing you have to worry about in space is not going crazy, right? <laughs> right? Because that's what Hollywood tells you, right? Space is a vacuum, there's nothing there, it's just dark, cold, and no oxygen, and you will go nuts if you stay there too long. Hopefully, this talk has, has in these, these last few courses has shown you that it's nothing like that. That space is actually a very dynamic place. And I'll set that stage in a second because that's my last slide. Uh, but I want you to think about this. This is more like what space really is, right? Very dynamic, very busy, and very different depending upon where you are. And it's all due to this second chef. It's all due to our Earth's magnetic shield jailing things in their own little habitats. It's like a zoo. <laughs> Let's go to the tiger exhibit. Let's go to the monkey exhibit. Let's go to the bee exhibit, <laughs> right? They're all in their different locations and they kind of have a tendency to stay there. Um, space weather, of course, stirs things up. It can stir the pot and cause one, one group to be kind of transferred into another, right? Tigers can turn into monkeys that then need to be moved to the monkey cage, <laughs> right? And, and things like that. But um, overall, we, we, we do have a very dynamic environment and things happen in particular places for particular reasons. And we do just have to really know where we are and what orbit we're in to be able to handle the types of hazards that we see there.
And so this is why when people say, well, let's just take humans and go just do exactly what we do in low Earth orbit and repair the Hubble with EVAs, let's take astronauts to GEO and have them repair the GEO satellites. Uh, no. There's a hundred times the amount of electron flux in a, in a GEO orbit that is in LEO, two orders of magnitude higher. Astronauts would be in real trouble in GEO if they dwelled there, right? They're in the outer zone. You do not want to have astronauts repairing missions in GEO. Sorry, not safe. Um, so, you know, for uh, lots of different reasons, surface charging, for example, right? What they'd worry about more is, is being shocked. And if you had an astronaut get shocked, um, it could stop their heart. It could cause them to vomit. Can you imagine vomiting in a spacesuit with zero gravity and now you can't wipe your face? Sound like a life or death situation? What if you aspirate what you just accidentally, you know, vomited because some because the spacecraft tased you and shocked the crap out of you? Sound safe? No. So we really have to think very carefully as we become a spacefaring race in terms of being out in the near Earth environment. Because the microclimates out there, some of them just like just like terrestrial weather, just like the here on Earth. You don't want to walk up the bikini, you know, in a bikini to the top of Mount Everest, right? You just wouldn't do it. You'll die of hypothermia, right? Same kind of thing in space. You've got these microclimates that are very much dictated by what is going on in that particular regime. And, and we need to rethink how we think about space. So hopefully that helps everyone. And why space is not, whoops, why space is not easy and how much we have to learn. Man, we have a lot to learn. And why, when people ask me questions, I don't always have the answers. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> There's still so much we have left uh, to explore. So it becomes a real problem. And then one last thing before I, I just stop and, and take questions is, is this one thing, this will set us up for the next, for the next um, set of things where we start going into the ionosphere. And this is what makes part of this um, whole Starlink generation, very interesting for, for space weather physicists. Because um, when you start getting into low Earth orbit, you know, I talk far more about MEOs and GEOs and HEOs because we're talking about radiation belts and radiation particles. But you know what, the, the neutral environment causes problems too. Because when you get down to low Earth orbit, you can get yourself in trouble because of atmospheric drag. When, when you have satellites that are in low Earth orbit, if they're at about 500 kilometers or below, and believe it or not, some Starlink satellites are. They say, no, we don't have any. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Let's go look at go go take a look at the, you know, the trackers that are that are tracking the Starlinks. And you'll see there are quite a few that are at 400, 450, you know, somewhere in there. Um, but those satellites, right, are in an area that you when you have a geomagnetic storm from a space weather event, the Earth's atmosphere puffs out. It actually changes the scale height. And when that happens, that causes more drag on low Earth orbiting satellites. Now those low Earth orbiting satellites, if they've got big solar panels, hello Starlink, the albatross of, of low Earth orbiting you know, satellites, they've got massive solar panels. Those are like parachutes. It's like having a drag chute on the back of your spacecraft. And those things will actually you know, really cause drag to, to, to be felt even at low, um, even at low scale height changes. Um, and so this can be, especially for lightweight spacecraft, this can be a real problem, right? Where the saddle, where the, or the um, you know, you've got a payload that, that doesn't have a lot of inertia anyway. And you have these massive wings that are, <laughs> you know, easily the size of the spacecraft, if not much, much, much larger. And so that a little bit of drag can go a long way, right? And so you can actually change the satellite orbits because what happens is that you slow the drag, obviously slows the satellite down. But if you look at Kepler's laws, when you take a satellite that's moving and you slow it down, well, it will drop in altitude and then it'll pick up speed. So what happens is that as you're tracking a, a Starlink satellite, you're expecting it to be over, you know, track across the sky like this. But during a geomagnetic storm, you're beginning to track it and you'll lose track and it will slow down and it'll fall. And then it'll go faster because as you get to a lower orbit, it goes faster than it was at a higher orbit. That's higher orbits go slower than lower orbits. So as this thing falls and then picks up speed, what happens is that you're expecting the satellite to be here, 
when in actuality, it's lower in altitude and advanced in time from where you expect it to be. So you're looking for it up here and you need to look for it down here. And it's like, oh my gosh. And I can't even tell you how many times we lose CubeSats. That's one of the reasons why a lot of CubeSats anymore have two meter beacons on them. So they'll actually actively ping and say, I'm here, find me, because we lose them so often. That's one of the interesting um, uh, lessons learned from the CubeSat generation is that we're finding that more and more of them, we, and, and these are serious missions. I mean, these are, you know, multi-million dollar missions in some of these. And they, they'll find that they lose their CubeSat and they can't recover it because they can't find it. So ones that have active two meter beacons on them um, become, you know, that, that's becoming a, a more commonplace. Sorry, amateur radio operators, they are using two meters. So um, expect more of that in the future. But here's an example, as I'm, my long-winded talk here, here's an example from the 1989 storm. Remember we talked about this being the standard candle, um, the March 1989 storm, which is the one that caused the Toronto Stock Exchange to close. It really changed our whole latitude when it came to understanding space weather events. As a matter of fact, I think it, it um, changed how we did CONOPS for SOHO and you know, made, us, made us realize we need to have a chronograph monitoring all the time, you know, the sun in real time all the time um, because we missed the CME. We had solar max mission up when this event happened. We missed the CME uh, observing it, and it hit Earth, and we didn't even know. So um, when that, so that that storm changed so many things in operational space weather. I can't even tell you. But here's another example of how it changed things. So this is, I believe, this is this is the um, in red. You have the AP index. If anyone remembers the AP index when I've talked about it in the past, AP is like KP but it's just averaged over a day. So instead of it being averaged over three hours, it's just averaged over a day. So you can tell there was a geomagnetic storm right here, okay? Because AP jumped, right, over the course of a couple days, okay? Well, look what happened. It took a day or so for the magnetic, for the, for the atmosphere to get, you know, to feel the full effects of that geomagnetic storm, but it caused it to puff out. And look what happened over the course of that time. Look how many satellite tracks, and I'm saying that in blue, See the tracks? So these are the tracks over the, you know, as they, as they go around the Earth and, and those are being measured, the telemetry with the spacecraft. Look how many satellite tracks were lost right after that geomagnetic storm. Look how much they jumped up. 1,400 satellite tracks lost. We've seen this happen time and time again. As a matter of fact, in the 1969, I think it was like almost a Carrington class event, NORAD lost half its catalog of low Earth orbiting satellites. They lost them because the atmosphere drag was so intense that they just lost, they couldn't track them anymore. They, 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 they changed orbits <laughs> just through the drag. So this is going to be a very interesting challenge for Starlink, which is part of the reason why I know Elon had changed his and, and upped his initial um, orbit parameters. Because I think he originally wanted them to be sitting around, all of them to be sitting around 400. And he pushed that up to five, five to six. Because they say about between 500 to 600 and 50. I've, I've seen multiple ar arguments that, no, you only need to be above 500. Other people say, no, you really need to be above 650 for your drag to become minimal. So for this problem, for to be as base basically to be able to get rid of this problem and not have it be. But any satellite that's sitting below, I would say 500 kilometers is, is in real trouble and possibly uh, below 650. Like I said, depending upon who you talk to. And that is definitely the regime and the, the realm of Starlink. So it will be very interesting when we start getting really big geomagnetic storms to see how the ionosphere, which is really what we're talking about here, how that begins to affect even satellite orbits. And then next time, of course, we will talk about everything else the ionosphere does because it does a lot when it comes to radio signals, right? We're not talking about damaging the radio signals. We're just talking about interfering with them and bending them and tweaking them and scattering them and making reception and sometimes transmission, at least from the ground, very difficult or challenging, we'll say. So with that, that is the end of the magnetospheric series, the, the M courses. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. This was regime one in, um, we have still two other regimes to do. So I'll take questions now if you guys would like. I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? 1.30, oh, two and a half hours. That's not too bad. Hey, under three, oh my goodness. <laughs> so. So any questions, guys? Hopefully this was clear. Anybody need me to go over anything again? Two meters, yes, Greg, you're right, two meters. Is that why my SpaceX is linking them together? 
Uh oh, I missed. I'm I'm obviously coming in on something. Um, I don't know, but yeah, but remember that's a, that you bring up good point there, um, uh, Wild Spirit. You bring up the the point that space or Starlink satellites have four crosslinks. So they're doing laser crosslinks. So not only do they have to be able to, to maintain their orbit, but they've got to be able to maintain communication with their three nearest neighbors. And so if, if maybe they are able to hang on to their altitude, but their neighbor isn't, or maybe all of them have some weird loss, right? So now they're all, I mean, so not only have you lost this one, but your three nearest neighbors, now you've got to figure out where they are and relink yourself to them, right? So you've got to find them. So what? Are, how how is Elon going to mitigate that? Is he just going to widen his beam? You know how how is he going to do that? Or is he is he going to quickly try to communicate to those satellites and reacquire and then give them new trajectories, new new telemetry for where the other satellites are? To know, to know. And how is he going to do that if half of his constellation, everything on the day side, goes out at all at the same time? To know, it's going to be very interesting. Like I said. You would think they getting they'd be they would think about getting the right altitude right away. Really expensive to lose your satellite due to this. Well, remember Elon's goal is really was to get the the um, frequency bands, eminent domain. You know, you're like I'm the first there. I'm planting my fl my flag in the sand. So he now has access to those bands. So that was the most important part of it. Um, so I, I'm not sure he's as worried about that. I think he'll handle that when it happens. Uh, let's see, deeper look. Is the South Atlantic anomaly growing? Oh, are the magnetic poles moving toward each other? Yes. Yes, of course it's related. Uh, could cosmic rays be fueling the South Atlantic anomaly lightning? Yes, um, all of all is true. The South Atlantic anomaly is, is moving. If I recall, it's moving over the South American continent. So it's moving, you know, depending upon which, which way you're looking. Um, it's moving over from from the Atlantic more over to the South American continent, and it is changing shape. And I forget a bit how it's changing shape, but yes, this has to do with the fact that our dipole field is flipping. Right, the dipole field component isn't the only component of our magnetic field; um, it's just one of multiple components. Um, we have the octopole, we have the quadrupole component, the octopole component, higher and higher harmonic components. And, and, um, and those are all taking a larger role, which is why the poles are moving. Eventually, they're going to split. As a matter of fact, I, I, there was someone who was talking. I, I saw some work that was done recently showing that you can already start seeing that split. Um, so there's a very good chance that before too long, we will have four poles. And, and they'll be not completely in the north and the south, but they'll be you know, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast. At that point, it's going to be very interesting to find out what the South Atlantic anomaly does, if it even stays there. Once, once the dipole component of our field is, is nulled, right, because then it's going to start rebuilding, right? Don't worry. The sun does this every 11 years, guys, and the sun's fine. It doesn't blow up. It, it, you know, nothing happens. And the earth has gone through this reversal many times. Um, so don't worry. It's not, it's not life ending life as we know it. It really isn't. It's just going to make space weather interesting for a few hundred, maybe thousand years. Um, but there's a very good chance that if are there even going to be stable radiation belts at all? If there are, what are they going to look like? I don't know. Are we going to have four sets of them instead of two zones? Are we going to have are we going to have two sets of donuts? I mean, because we have multiple poles now. So how does that work? I don't know. I've seen models of the Earth's magnetic field, like like geophysical models of what it looks like when the Earth's field flips. They show the magnetic field lines, and they look like taffy. I mean, it looks like like something in a taffy puller. <laughs> and I look at that and I go, my God, that's incredibly chaotic. How is that going to work? You know, we'll cope, right? Thank goodness it's not changing the lines of force in terms of satellites, right? The satellite orbital dynamics are the same. What's different is going to be our, our mission parameters, right? All those design specifications that I talked about and SpinViz and all those models, they'll all change. And now we'll have to build spacecraft that can survive in these new microclimates. We'll just learn space weather all over again. Luckily, it's going to happen slowly, so we'll just incrementally change things and 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 modify them until you know, you know, until we put them into place, and then we put them in place and do the best we can, just as we've always done. So it's something that will be very interesting, but it's not something that is is going to cause any catastrophic change here at Earth. Um, you know. For for all practical purposes, space weather is not uh, life 
uh, affecting, I mean, or life affecting, life threatening, right? In the very minor cases that it even could be, um, that's so speculative, it's, it's silly. I mean, un, but of course, all that's gonna change as we become a spacefaring race. If we put ourselves outside of our protective cocoon, which is our upper atmosphere, then yeah, then those, those um, possibilities become far more real. But that, that is for a spacefaring race to decide how quickly or how well we do it, right? That's, that's our choice. Um, are the poles acting like a solar cycle's magnetics? Very similar, yes, yeah. So just like we have a multipolar sun during solar maximum, that's when the dipole field is flipping of the sun, we're gonna have a multipolar Earth, right? Not a big deal. Aurora will be in more places. Um, there's a, a possibility that EMPs on the ground will be even less. There's a possibility that geomagnetic induced currents will actually be smaller because we have a we, our magnetic field will not be as strong. So certain aspects of space weather may be more intense, but certain aspects of space weather will be minimized. So people say, oh, it's all Armageddon. And it's like, no, that's not how the physics works. Certain physics occurs because magnetic shield is super strong and that actually causes stronger effects on the ground, not weaker. So when you weaken the Earth's magnetic shield, you, you will actually in, reduce certain space weather effects on the ground, right? So it's, it's just like everything else in space weather, it's a mixed bag. It's not just one way that, you know, if you make it one way, it's gonna benefit all and you make it another way, it's gonna make everything worse. No, you do, you know, you make it one way, you weaken the Earth's magnetic shield and it's gonna help here and hinder here. It's a mixed bag and it will always be that way. So don't believe anybody if they just say that, oh, it's gonna be awful and the Earth's field is flipping and, and it's gonna ruin everything. No, it's not, not. It's like actually gonna make certain things easier. Maybe better on the grids, probably one of the biggest issues that we have for a catastrophic event is that, um, you know, we worry about our power grids going out. Well, if we don't have a dipole field component and the field is much weaker, GICs will be lower. Hey, that's the grid guys are going, yeah, <laughs> flip, field flip, right? Because they're loving that. They don't, they want no geomagnetically induced currents. That's their, that's, that's like the biggest migraine for them. So, okay, hopefully that answers that. Um, children of the sun, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, pay attention to your health as you evolve in real time. You know, I'm, that's one of the things I'm really loving about um, uh, space weather in, you know, in the era of us becoming spacefaring and Elon and, and, and um, um, Bezos and, all the, and, and um, Branson, all of them going out into space and becoming, you know, going out there and putting them, their own bodies at risk. I love that because it's forcing the medical field to kind of do like a right turn and say, wait, there's radiation in space? Wait, wait, maybe we need to get in on this, right? And maybe we need to do some research here. So it's getting the medical field finally to pay attention. And there have been a lot of us who've been trying to do that for ages, but you know, it's only been the realm of the astronauts. And that's a very select few. And so they've all had their own personal doctors be able to handle that. But things are changing, right? We're, we're getting Aurora tourism now for regular people. And so there's now real money to be found in doing this kind of research. And I think that's gonna change the whole dynamic when it comes to um, uh, us understanding radiation and, and its effects on humans. Uh, and it'll ultimately affect and help the Mars generation. And everybody wants to go and colonize Mars because it will help us understand how, how well we'll be able to deal with that. And, and like I've mentioned, you know, we even now have missions like Spacebit, companies like Spacebit who are dedicating their missions, the Artemis mission and, um, and their, their work there with the, with the spiders on the moon. Um, dedicating it to space weather, to understanding um, the, the radio communications issues that space weather induces and the human element, uh, the radiation induced sicknesses that can be caused by living on the surface and, and now exploring lava tubes to see whether or not they can create a safe haven for us. Those types of missions should have been done back in the Apollo days, right? But we didn't have the wherewithal. We didn't understand what we understand now. And so I, that's why I'm so excited about companies like Spacebit. So. If you have a chance, check them out. Um, oh my God, group, you guys are also great. I'm having a moment over here. Oh, that's cool. Obviously you're getting a lot of support. See, I love this community. You guys are just wonderful. You just all help and, and encourage, encourage really good dialogue and debate. So this is so cool. Um, let's see, since we are switching more to electric cars, can they be affected by the sun's activity? Nah. 
Um, unless we got flying cars, maybe, you know, if you want to fly it 20,000 feet or something, maybe. Um, but no, the electric cars aren't going to be, that's not going to be a problem. Um, where, where we were, first of all, geomagnetically induced currents have to happen on big scales. So that's why power grids with the big long transmission lines become problems. And that's why, for instance, back in, in with the Carrington class event, you know, we heard about the North American, ugh, North American telegraph system failing. Okay, fine. That stuff happens because we had hundreds and hundreds of miles of unbroken lines. And the way space weather works, the way geomagnetically induced currents work, for example, is that you have these tiny little potentials because the Earth's magnetic field that's wiggling and, and inducing these potentials and these currents, it's not a very strong magnetic field, right? It's only as strong as your fridge magnet, to be honest. And you go like, whoa, really? It's only that weak? Yeah. But the thing is, is it's a fridge magnet the size of Earth, right? So it's, it, it, again, it's that thing where, you know, it's not very strong, but it wields a big stick. It's just it's, it's this massive thing. So um, it ends up affecting you in ways you weren't expecting. But the only way it can affect you is if you are a big thing that can feel its effects over hundreds and hundreds of miles, because you can take a tiny effect and then add another tiny effect and another tiny effect and another tiny. And as you add it up over the hundreds and hundreds of miles, suddenly you get a big effect, but it's incremental. So it's not going to, it'll blow your power grid. A Carrington event will blow your power grid, but your car battery is fine. And you're thinking, well, why is that? Well, because power battery, you know, if you had a, if you have a car battery the size of Lake Michigan, then okay, yeah, maybe you might be in trouble. But something small, people have asked me about pacemakers and things like that on the ground with geomagnetically induced currents. No, no, it's not going to be a problem. The only people who seem to have issues with that um, are people who are electromagnetically sensitive anyway. And there are, there is a subset of the population who are. And they, you know, have things like malaise. I had someone the other day telling me they were had migraine with aura um, during during geomagnetic storms. People who have metal poisoning, heavy metal poisonings, you know, that's very common. Um, but those people also uh, often can't hold a cell phone. I've talked about that in the past. I know someone who has mercury poisoning, and every time she has a phone call that lasts more than five or ten minutes, she'll get a rash because she's held her cell phone up to her, and she gets a rash on her hand. Um, and it's absolutely attributable to the electromagnetic pulses that are coming from your phone as it's talking to the cell phone, the cell towers. So there are people that deal with that, people who have pins and, and, and you know, um, cyborg, <laughs> right? They're, they've got metal parts of their bodies or pins or plates or things like that. Someone I know gets migraines constantly um, during geomagnetic storms because they had a damage to their, their skull and they've got a metal plate in their skull and... and it hurts, it physically hurts when there are geomagnetic storms. So these microcurrents and these micro potentials are, you know, in, in certain people, they're biologically active. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to say other than ouch, and I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, that kind of thing does happen. But for the general populace, it's not a problem. And it's really just a problem if you happen to be, you know, uh, a, big, a big system, right? Like a, like a, like a power grid. So, um, okay. Any other questions, guy, guys? Oh, good. Thank you. From Honolulu. Huge fan of yours. Oh, thank you so much. Is that Melinda? Oh, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. And thank you, Jerry, for putting, uh, putting the, the Patreon stuff. Yeah, if you are somebody who is super interested in, in maybe steering the ship or, or helping decide what, what we talk about in these mini courses, just head over to Patreon because that's where, that's where all the heavy duty um, people are. I mean, that's where we all really talk about stuff and I give a lot more updates and a lot more detail. Uh, and even in my forecast, I'll do informal forecasts and give you so much more detail about what's going on. And that's where you get to see where the sausage is made, right? Because I'm not, I'm not shy. They all know. <laughs> they all know I am not shy about saying what I know and what I don't know. And uh, scratch my head in front of them going, gosh, I wish I could figure this out. So it's, um, yeah, it, it's a very fun place. And we're all very friendly. And we're all very, very supportive of one another. I have ESP and sensitive, sensitive mobile phones. Right. Well, there you go. So, yeah. So space weather may be something you need to follow. Um, if you if you have those types of sensi sensitivities, exactly. Um, that's that's the way it goes. Okay. Um, let's see. 
sleep disturbances, right? Cell phone towers you live by for 10 years. Yeah, I will not, I refuse to live near power lines, high, uh, like like international, you know, not international, but inter, you know, the, the big tall ones, the, the big ones. I, I refuse to live near those and I refuse to live super close to cell towers for the same reason. Um, we, we have way too much, you know, electromagnetic energy all over the place. And, and when it's really powerful, yeah, I think it can be biologically active. Um, I was wondering how RF communications will be on Mars. Whew. That is a loaded question. Yes, um, direct line of sight will have to, will, will definitely be the, the main way. During inclement space weather, Mars's atmosphere goes completely opaque to um, radio communications, meaning um, satellites overhead can't talk to them um, because the the especially radiation storms, the communication the the they penetrate all the way to the ground. So if you're like at Earth and you see during radiation storms, people have a lot of trouble doing navigation and doing communications up at high latitudes. It's because that's all the, the radiation storms penetrate the atmosphere up there. Uh, at Mars, if that radiation goes all the way to the ground and it's all over the at every latitude, because it is, because uh, Mars doesn't have a, a shield like we have. So the radiation penetrates all the way down. And um, and that means line of sight only. Uh, and, it, and one of the things I was talking to is people or not, I was talking to uh, Pavlov from um, Spacebit the CEO there. And um, well, I was talking about how it will be very interesting to see if during radiation storms, if you can do direct line of sight, or if you are talking to something that's above you, if the radiation, you know, the, the, the radiation storms coming down, if that becomes a problem with Zenith, or can you, can you, you know, is it fine as long as you're looking parallel to the ground? Or, you know, are you going to have issues? Even line of sight will be very interesting to see if there's if there's some level of, of um, you know, for really big storms. I think line of sight will be fine, but doing over the horizon communication, doing sky wave communication can't happen during inclement space weather. So all that beautiful idea that, that Elon has of creating a Starlink constellation over Mars, great, except when there are things like, you know, big space weather storms, because you're not going to be able to communicate to them. You're not going to be able to get it up or down. So there's going to have to be ground-based beacons, and that's part of what Spacebit is doing with their little mar their rovers. They're doing little. They're using Wi-Fi frequencies, but they're actually going to be on on the moon, um, creating these like little repeaters, like little repeater stations, where they can communicate from one repeater, one little rover to the next rover to the next rover, and do like a leapfrog. And I think that's really the type of of, of stable installation we're going to have to have on Mars. Uh, because we just can't do Skywave reliably uh, during inclement space weather. So uh, it's a very, very interesting question, and I, a lot more research needs to be done. Oh, and also, because it's a different atmosphere, different densities, different magnetic field strengths, the frequencies will be radically different, um, for even for Skywave communication, than, than, for, um, than, than it would be on Earth. But, but Skywave apparently is possible there. Uh, there's a lot of people who've done, especially in the military, who have done reports. I've, I've read a lot of master's theses on it. So it is possible, but it's just going to be very different. So great, great question. Um, is there something, let's see, is there something we can do to help someone that gets migraines during geomagnetic storms? Gosh, I don't know. I wouldn't think so because you're getting induced from the ground oftentimes. So I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if there's been enough. I think it's a great question, but I don't know uh, the answer to that. And I think the medical professionals will be the ones that will have to to, um, uh, to deal with that. Um, I do know some people have, have actually self-medicated by using things like TENS units. You know, they actually, the, the little units that actually pulse electricity into muscles to make them, you know, to stimulate them. Some people use it actually in their spinal column if they've had spinal injuries or things like that to actually stabilize their um, their their nervous system. Something like that may be of use where you're actually using an active uh, methodology to counteract something that is more variable. I but I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, it's an it's an interesting. It's definitely an interesting field of research that is probably up and coming. Mars wants to kill you. I hope not. I hope not. I'm, I want to talk about spiders on Mars. I, I'd love to see the space bit spiders on Mars. Um, <laughs> right, inner climate. Nice, nice. Uh, 
um, nice lyric quote there, Rocket Man. Okay, any other questions, guys? I'm trying to read. Um, just join you on Patreon. Oh, thank you. Very stoked and blessed. I will I will ping you there. I will say hi. Thank you so much. Or say hi to me. Post, post in the community and, and, and we'll chat. I believe Elon is trying to habitate Mars because he really wants the innovation for Earth, but no one will fund hippie ideas like saving the Earth. So he just didn't shoot for the moon, but, but Mars. Yeah, other people told me he's from there. <laughs> I think your, your idea is cool, but I like the other idea too. <laughs> he just wants to get back home. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I don't care. Honestly, I, I think, I think um, it's that, that same thing where you wake up in the 21st century and it still feels like the 19th. And it's like, well, let's live up to the 21st century for God's sake. And so to, to a great degree, I'm trying to do the same thing just in a different way. To me, the 21st century isn't the 21st century unless you're talking about the weather right? Not the weather here on earth. We did that in the 19th century. Let's talk about the weather in space, right? And I do, I talk about the weather on Mars, right? You've seen me do it many times. So um, that's, that's my, that's my contribution. And yes, I think to, to some degree, I have a, a similar, uh, I think that that's a, a similar impetus for all of us who are trying to get off world. Uh, we do feel that the 21st century really can't be the 21st century until we really start talking that way. Um, and looking at ourselves as being spacefaring. Okay, yeah, visual only migraines. That's that's a aura, right? That's a visual aura. I get auditory aura, strangely enough. Um, so I know you're feeling. I don't get migraines very much. But I do get them, but but auto, I, I get. Um, yeah, sometimes I forget how to say the alphabet. You know, believe it or not, I, I lose my ability to speak. It's it's pay, it's it's a bit scary, but I know what I'm doing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You wanted to read the board. You wanted to read the. Do you want to read this? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, Rasputin. So I got that. Hopefully. Tell me if you want a different slide. I'll put it up. Um, I can also make myself disappear if you want. <laughs> Let's see. I wear the shielding cap. Oh, it looks like it sounds like you guys are talking a little bit about this stuff. That's fantastic. Hopefully you can help each other because you probably know more about it than me. If you have, if you're, in, if you're affected by this stuff, you may have more information than I do on this. So, so, you know, Please talk to each other, and I will definitely read the comments afterwards because um, I want to learn as much as I can. Even anecdotal information is important. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I stay away from finances, so um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that millionaires do that that are intriguing financially. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank God I'm not one of them. So, um, okay. Any other question? Do you think the galaxy has seasons? Oh, that's cool. You mean our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy? Yeah, why wouldn't it, right? Because it, it's, its environment, right? It's like if you think of the Milky Way galaxy as its own solar system, then it's going to have galaxies and other things around it that are probably just you know, bigger or, or smaller. And, and depending upon how it's moving, it could. It very well could. But I think in order to have seasons, you really need to be orbiting something. Right, so the Milky Way galaxy itself has to be orbiting what a supermassive black hole or something like that. So it has to come and see the same thing. Has, things have to be periodic. So if and and astrophysicists could probably answer this. I obviously can't because I'm not. That's not my bailiwick. Um, right. I, I just care about our solar system. But the idea that if the Milky Way galaxy is orbiting something, right, and and sees the same neighbors over and over again once every you know good God. 100 billion light years has it, you know, and it moves in its own timeline, um, then yeah, why wouldn't it, right? Why wouldn't it see? Because if you think of the, the universe as like this big cosmic clock, right? There's all these different clocks ticking and the periodic functions keep coming around. I always look at our, our, our celestial sky as, as the best cosmic clock that's ever been designed. You know, you look at your grandfather clock as like a mini scaled down version of the universe because the universe is this really cool clock that takes into account everything, right? And I'm sure the, astro the astrologers will really love that because, you know, when you look at it that way, then you understand astrology. It's a big cosmic clock, right? And it defines lots of different things about humanity. Um, and no, I'm not like Carl Sagan. I do not dismiss astrology. Astrologers have a place in this world just like anyone else does. Um, galactic seasons, yeah, it's a cool idea. Any other questions, guys? I'm seeing lots of fun discussions, but no more questions. As above, so below. Very nice inner climate. I like that. Yes. 
Uh, what advancement in space weather research are you most excited about and looking forward to? <sighs> oh, man. Um, I think right now, uh, I think right now it's probably Artemis, what we're going to find with Artemis, um, revisiting the moon and seeing, and seeing that space weather is a thing. And it's not let, what Neil deGrasse Tyson calls it as space weather is, when I think of space weather, I think of weather on other planets. I hate that quote. Um, space weather is a thing because space weather is space weather. It's weather from space. And it's not terrestrial weather on other planets. Um, and, and I think Artemis is gonna force the public to see that. And the idea of understanding what the radiation environment is on the moon and ultimately what the radiation environment is on Mars on a global scale is gonna be paradigm shifting. Um, I think because I think when they realize, when people realize that there's, there is such a thing as space weather in, in space, in, in, you know, on these other planets and, in, and on the moon who doesn't even have an atmosphere, then they're gonna realize that space is not empty, right? And, and space and, and spaces is, is a whole nother animal and it's and it's something to be in it's not just a cosmic dark it's not just a black void that all these astrophysicists want to tell you about and the only thing that they care about are these micronovas coming from these baby stars that are behaving badly and and so everybody cowers in a corner because they're afraid our sun's going to go micronova and you know in the human race and it's like no 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 that's not what space is about right space shouldn't be like that and yet we've got so much hollywood propaganda that has just ruined what space is for so many people and therefore ruined what space weather is because people don't think it exists other than micronovas, right? And supernovas and anything with the word nova in it. Um, and, I, and I'm waiting for that paradigm to break so that we can have a, a rational dialogue. So I think that is really where, where I'm the most excited is the human element of space interacting with space weather really for the first time on a on a grand scale um the other side of things that i'm super excited about is watching all the operational agencies now pick up stealth cmes as a real thing and that again involves the human element because we have these invisible or near invisible um storms that come out they're like the opposite of a micronova right they're the they're the things that are so wispy that you can't really see them even with instruments that we use all the time you have to really pay attention and use and use very new detection methods or different detection methods to to see them and and then predict how they're going to affect earth and some of them really do impact earth in, in very serious ways and so when that happens um a lot of times the the space weather agencies have are blindsided because they never saw them coming and and so we're making a lot of headway in that regard and just last month the moss walk for the first time so this is the met office in the uk put out a an official report um, for their, their space weather geophysical activity report. And they had the phrase stealth CME in there. Oh, I just was in heaven. Watching us here on social media move the needle in terms of academic research on stealth CMEs, because I'm part of that, and then have that move the needle again when it comes to official space weather agencies around the world starting to pick up some of the things that we're talking about. That to me is unbelievably exciting because it shows that we, how we as, as citizen scientists, we as the public can really make a difference in changing um, the paradigm, even at official agencies who usually look at the public and say, well, you're not what we're interested in. But we are, we're becoming that. And again, as the human species becomes more spacefaring and as we have more civilian agencies going out into space, um, the, the concept of space weather is becoming so much more relevant. So that's really where I'm super excited. That now there's a lot of other stuff that's going on in space weather, like interferometry of, um, of solar storms. And of course, obviously Parker Solar Probe, you know, so, so interferometry will give us like a three-dimensional view um, of, of coronal mass ejections instead of the, the plane of sky thing we've seen with chronographs. That's a neat thing that's never been done before and I can't wait to see that because we need a three-dimensional view of these structures in order to understand them better and model them better. So that's a neat one. And then of course, everything going on with solar probe and solar orbit are so close to the sun, seeing how radically different 
uh, the solar wind is than, than we've ever thought it to be with these switchbacks and these little micro jets and really the magnetic carpet that the sun is, um, all that being projected into space and then a lot of reconfiguration being done really close to the sun for it to kind of smooth out and become the solar wind that we're so used to measuring here at Earth. Those underlying processes are gonna tell us so much when it comes to um, understanding, obviously the heating of the corona and also understanding how particles move in, in near the sun and move out into, into the space and, and ultimately reach us here at 1AU because there's been lots of different questions. So those missions are gonna be, um, you know, I think are gonna continue to give us new data for decades, really, even if they only last another year or two. I think they'll, we'll be mining those data sets for decades and um, likely a new theory that will change even how Parker's, the Parker solar wind, um, you know, the Eugene Parker theory of, of how the solar wind forms, it will change that and we'll have a fundamentally new concept of the solar wind, which will be neat. And then that will uh, fuel astrophysicists looking at stars even further away. It'll fuel and, and feed their analyses as well, because knowing our star helps us understand other stars in other galaxies. So hopefully, hopefully that gives you enough uh, idea of where I'm interested. But right now I'm really focused on, on the new, the, the paradigm with, with the civil and commercial um, spacefaring push to get humans in space, because I think that's where we're gonna see lots of changes really fast. And let's hope we can keep up with it in our, in our field and keep people safe. Okay, any other questions, guys? Because that was really good, um, really good dialogue here. Ah, oh, okay. Is it okay to re here? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> um, you guys are very welcome. I'm seeing lots of thank yous. You're, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, so we finally get out of magnetosphere and get to go into the, into the ionosphere. My goodness, I, I don't think the ionosphere is going to take nearly as much time. Um, how I say that and then and then I have to backtrack and I say, wait a minute, but I have to add this and I have to add this and I'm thinking, okay. No, I don't think it will take quite as much time, but there's definitely gonna be a few surprises in the ionosphere because there's, and, and a lot of you amateur radio operators will enjoy it because there's some things about radio propagation that we will talk about that may, that are counterintuitive. And hopefully um, for those who are, who are ready to go into the advanced level uh, of understanding radio propagation, then you'll, you'll enjoy some of the, the ionospheric anomalies that we'll go into and talk about a little bit. Tamitha, did you ever have the chance to speak to Ben Davidson? No, I, you know, why? Um, I mean, I get enough of his crowd in here that basically all they want to do is tell me that I suck and that my hair is falling out and that I've got man hands and that um, I don't know what I'm doing and that I'm the stupidest person that ever walked the face of the earth. Why would I want to talk to a crowd that basically has never said any nice things to me ever? And I don't even talk badly about Ben. Um, so, you know, it, do, it just doesn't sound like my kind of crowd. I, I'm more interested in people who are willing to learn and who are willing to have open dialogues and are willing to try to push the field forward, not trying to tear each other down. So I don't have any interest in it. Um, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Besides, he's already trashed so many of my colleagues and scientists, friends, trying to get people not to trust us, which is sad which is part of the reason why I did the whole SpinViz thing today is because I'm trying to you know, show that that's just not true. This is completely unfounded. So no, I, I, I don't really have much interest. Sorry about that. I have nothing against Ben, but I just don't want that, 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 that kind of attention. I have enough people who, I have enough knives in my back as it is. <laughs> I don't need more. I don't need to invite more. Um, so wow, things are going up fast. So I, I'm not able to see this stuff. Will you talk about sprites? I can. That's a really good, um, you know, that's where you start getting the neutral atmosphere and, 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 and ionosphere coupling. You know, I might. Yeah, that's a neat idea because there's some neat stuff I'm learning about lightning and, and, and the, the communication, the two-way talk between neutral and, and upper ionosphere stuff, or I mean, lower ionosphere stuff. I don't know. Let me think about that. That, that might be, bring it up again when we do the ionospheric thing, because it'll take us a couple of courses to get through that. Bring that up again and, and we'll see how it unfolds. But I might, I might. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for your work. Oh, you're welcome. That is why I put your name to Brett Weinstein. 
Brett Weinstein. I don't know Brett. Who's Brett Weinstein? Why, why does that name sound familiar and I can't remember? Help me remember who Brett Weinstein is. Um, still here and loving it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Shake off the haters. Yeah, thank you, Interclimate. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, they seem to be everywhere. I think it's probably COVID or something. People are getting more, you know, <laughs> it's just scary. <laughs> Um, what would you see, this is Galactic, Greg's, what would you see as the main warning, wait, main warning a CME is strong enough to take out the power grid before it hits? Woof. Um, you know what? That's actually, there is a way. Um, that would be having to be the speed because we actually had an event like that back in 1972 when we had that event. Dolores Knipp wrote a, a paper on that. Um, that was the one that detonated all the seam mines, right? And, um, and that event, believe it or not, its magnetic field was not conducive to a geomagnetic storm. Its magnetic field was all, almost all northward. So the DST, the, this is the Disturbance Storm Time Index, which I talked about in this, believe it or not, I talked a little bit about it because I talked about the ring current, right? We will talk about the DST, but um, that is a measure of how strong that ring current is, right? And if you don't remember the ring current, go back to the previous class, M2, and you'll, you'll see me talk about the current systems. And the ring current is a low energy current system that is co-located with the radiation belts, right? But it has all the mass. So it's the low energy stuff. But when that ring current gets energized, it actually depresses the strength of the Earth's magnetic shield. And we see that in a, as a dip in DST. Now a real strong storm, a Carrington class event storm, the one that happened in 1859, got us to a minus like 1700 on DST. Okay, an average storm will be about minus 100. A big storm will be minus 300, okay? Carrington class event got us down to minus 1700. That was, and that was reconstructed. This storm in 1972, which was also a Carrington class event, was also the fastest event ever on record in the, in the space age. Um, this event only got us to like minus 170 something. It wasn't that big. It was something we could easily write out. And yet it took out the power grid in less than four minutes. The reason why, was not because of the geomagnetic storm, but because of the EMP that was associated with it. This storm was like a big, fast, insanely fast bumper car. This storm came and hit the earth super hard and super fast. And remember the earth is springy, right? The earth's magnetic shield is springy. But what happens when you, when you bring the, the magnetic field lines together, right? You, if this is normal, you push those magnetic field lines together, they get tighter that causes the magnetic field strength to go way up real fast. And so that's what happened is that the Earth's magnetic shield went compressed, the field strength shot up over the, you know, like crazy. And at the ground level, that changing magnetic field strength so quickly caused the electric field to change, right? You, draw, you changing magnetic field, change a magnetic field in time, you can induce currents. You can induce an electric field and you can induce currents. Okay, because the electric field and magnetic fields are like the right hand and the left hand. They shake, they shake each other's hands all the time. So you can't have one without the other. So you created a very fast, you know, pulse, an electromagnetic pulse. And this was a G3, I mean, an E3 component, right? Because it's a geomagnetic storm induced. It's a CME induced magnetic uh, um, EMP. So it created an E3, but an incredibly big E3. And so it wasn't just felt at low latitudes, it was felt all over the globe. And in the North American continent, wham, it took out so much. I, I, I'm sure I showed that, that event to you. Oh, I don't remember what class, sadly. I think um, if anybody remembers a class where I showed that the sea mines being detonated, um, it might have been during radiation storms because that's when I was talking about the Apollo astronauts, right? I remember in 1972, we were up on the moon in March. March or April, and that Carrington class event in 1972, that bumper car, hit in August of that year. And that the radiation storm was so big that if the astronauts had been on the moon, they would have died. I mean, they had a lethal radiation dose from that Carrington class event. So we got very lucky with those, those astronauts. Um, as a matter of fact, the entire Apollo mission, we had radiation storms. They actually got clipped by a couple of those radiation storms, but they were low level. The biggest ones happened when we had nobody there when there were no missions. Imagine how totally different the landscape would have been had those, those um, radiation storms actually occurred coincident with uh, astronauts on the moon. It would have totally changed how we looked at space, space weather. We probably would have been so scared. We probably would have dismantled the rocket program and nobody would have gone out to space for the next hundred years. 
So I actually look at us as being fortunate from that perspective because we didn't even know radiation storms existed at the time. So, um, or at least we didn't we didn't understand them. So um, in this case, it, if you're looking at a big coronal mass ejection, a big solar storm coming out of the sun, and you have no idea a priori whether it's got southward magnetic field in it, which is what causes a geomagnetic storm. If the thing is insanely fast, it can still cause a, a very big effect at Earth um, simply because of that crushing, that bumper car. It, it'd bump off the Earth, it wouldn't reconnect, but it just bump off the Earth and be repelled, but then it would move off and, and, and the Earth would not end up getting any of its energy pumped in it inside it, right? That the Earth would be shielded, it would, the, the shield would work in the sense that, that any of that energy from the CME could not be pumped inside, all the particles and all that stuff, um, because you didn't reconnect the magnetic fields into one big system. But just the compression from being smacked in the face by this thing would be enough to cause this EMP and that's enough to take out the grid. So yes, there is in one case, definitely um, something we can tell right away. And of course, if something is going to be launched that's that big and intense, likely we're gonna get a radiation storm from it as well. And we'll know within an hour <laughs> because you see you know, the light from, from a big solar flare that is likely because if something's that energetic, you're gonna have a solar flare, you're gonna have everything. You're gonna have a solar flare, you're gonna have a CME and you're gonna have a radiation storm being launched. I mean, you just get the whole gamut with those in extremely intense events. So you'll see the light in eight minutes. You'll, you'll get bombarded by the relativistic particles, the, the, the solar radiation storm in less than an hour. Electrons come first, then the protons come and that'll be insane. And then you'll be showered by this radiation storm until the CME hits. But in this case, the CME hit in 17 hours. In 1972, it's the fastest one on record. From sun to earth, 17 hours. Whew. Talk about fast. It was like three, when it hit earth, it was, it was still moving over 3,000 kilometers an hour, I think, or I mean, kilometers a second, I mean. Um, and I forget how, how fast it was when it was launched. I, mean, I think the thing was insane. It was just not something we wanna see. So trust me. I will not be all smiles and happy if, if we end up getting something like that. You will see me very sober. You will see me very quiet. You will see me not like, you know, I'll just be very, it'll be a totally different thing because I won't, it won't be fun. It won't be joking. I won't be happy. Um, I'll be saying, okay, we need to take this seriously. This is, this is something that could be very big. Um, and I'll be very somber. So you'll see a side of me you've probably never seen. Um, the only people who've seen that side of me are people I've been briefing in, in other serious situations, you know, for my work. Um, most of the time, I'm just very happy and, and, and you know, lighthearted about this stuff. Yeah, I know. We're not. We're not ready for an, a Carrington event. But we can mitigate. I think the public is more powerful than it thinks. I think the, the power grid companies can use our help, like rolling blackouts, right? In extreme situations, we, I think we as the public can actually make a difference. We can reduce our electricity consumption because the biggest thing during Carrington class events, during any big storm event, is the grids need to stay online. They can't be taken down because once you start taking down parts of the grid, they become more unstable because you lose something called reactive power. So the last thing you want is to have those grids have to be taken offline. If everybody reduces the power load though, then we can survive these things. We can mitigate through them. Remember I talked about mitigation as being the key. And I think the public can do a lot to, to help mitigate these types of circumstances. And I don't think the power companies give us enough credit. So that's one of the reasons why I want space weather to become a, a, a very public, have a very public face and be talked about on the, the, the um, you know, nightly news is because if we all know a big Carrington class event storm is coming and we all, work with the power grid companies and say, we know this is going to be this massive load on you and it's going to be bad. Let us help. Let us reduce our load. Let us take the weight off you and the pressure off you. And because there's so many of us, you know, we're like ants in an anthill. One of us means nothing, but millions of us mean everything. So I think that's how we're going to help. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to win. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Uh, oh, you it rolled off. Um, I, I, I saw the elevating human consciousness. Wouldn't that be great? I'd love if space weather elevated human consciousness. 
oh, I, you know, I, I'm going to have to catch some of these. They're rolling off the screen so fast. I can't, I can't catch them. So I'll have to catch some of them. I saw a couple people who actually pinged me. I see my name when my name comes up in orange. I, I, I you know, my eye goes there. So I missed a couple, and I apologize for that. But I will take a look uh, at the replay. Do major events strengthen our magnetic she our magnetosphere or weaken it? Neither. I mean, they 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 temporarily strengthen from the per point of view of compression, but you know the magnetosphere is a spring. It's going to it's going to to it deals with itself in a steady state, so it's going to always work to minimize its energy state, right? And magnetic fields are springy. They just like slinkies. They they you know they relax. We actually even call it relaxing into a Taylor state, into a force-free state. Um, the Earth's magnetic shield tries to do that all the time. So it will always continue reconfiguring and shedding energy and, and throwing off plasmoids and, and, and shooting particles you know, into the uh, atmosphere to exhaust this, this energy. It'll always keep doing that until it's over, until it's back to being quiescent. So it, it strengthens it temporarily from that perspective, but it will always relax. I mean, remember that the generation of the Earth's magnetic shield is in the core, and that really is never touched, right? That's a neat thing about magnetic fields. They're, they're not really created nor destroyed in that sense. There's flux that reconnects and then comes back, and, and, and it always will regenerate itself. So, um, 2012, how bad would it be if it hits Earth? You mean the movie? Oh my gosh, I use that in my Millersville classes as an as example of how ridiculous um, Hollywood gets. Don't believe the hype. Hollywood is ridiculously horrible. Um, they, they, just, they just try to make space weather out to be like rocks from the sun that are going to split the earth in half. And it's just so wrong. Um, we don't ultimately have a plausible theory as to how the geomagnetic field is formed in the first place. Well, I don't know. I think you got, might get some serious argument from, uh, from geophysicists uh, who, who talk about the slurry, right? The magnetic, the iron core, the slurry that is, that is why Earth has a magnetic uh, shield. Mars does not and Venus does not. Venus, its core is all liquid. Mars' core is all solid. Earth is this slushy. Um, and it's the convection of the magnetic of the of the magnetic iron core that in in its co-rotating you know because we are a rigid body that's rotating um, there's rotation in there and that rotation and movement is actually causing the um, the electric fields and potentials to change so and then you've got the different densities because certain parts of the mag of the of the earth's core iron core is solid certain parts of it are liquid and that changes magnetic buoyancy and that changes of course that and then you've got the spinning and the, the rotation so there's there are many theories if you go to ucla for example they've got a lot of magnetic models of the earth's core and some of them actually flip they actually show that dipole flip so i i think that's arguable uh is that we don't have a, a plausible theory yes we do we have many of them uh, Galactic Greg's, I would love to interview. Oh, for for YouTube channels. Oh, cool. oh hey, yeah, ping me. Um, I'm good on Twitter. You can ping me on Twitter. You can ping me here, uh, Space Weather Woman at Gmail. I'll I'll look for you. So ping me if you have if you haven't and if you have pinged me and I haven't responded, ping me again. I'm 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 horrible sometimes. I get overloaded and and um, I'm slow to respond. But uh, Gary Winters, what effects does that? event cause on independent off-grid solar panels and equipment. You mean the Carrington class event? Independent off-grid solar panels. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, the size of a house, probably nothing. Probably nothing. Other than you're going to get, you know, you're connected. If you're connected to the grid, then, you know, you're going to deal with all the issues that they could, you know, brownouts and inrush current and who God knows all their, their problems. But if you're alone, standalone, I don't think it's going to be a problem because you're too small. Remember, Earth's magnetic field is, is a fridge magnet. And even a fridge magnet the size of your house is not going to cause a problem for you. Um, what effects that will cause an event? Oh, I already got it. Check out my earlier messages. I will. Uh, TS, TS Apostolos. It's hard to, for me to see here. Early message. I've tried to put your name forth to, oh, to Brett Weinstein, who is pushing Doomsday. Oh, gosh. Ugh. I, I don't even know how to inter interact with those people. Those people do it more for clickbait. They don't want, they don't care about the truth. A lot of these people, including Ben, have been contacted by people at NASA. And, and I, you know, um, Alan, uh, Alex Young and I have had many conversations. Some of these people don't, they don't want to be right. They want to be sensational. 
and that's what's more important to them. And okay, fine. But that's not going to make me want to continue engaging you in conversation. Because I'd rather be, I'd rather give people the truth and be less popular, right? I'd rather give you actionable things that matter, that make your life different, make your life better, make your life workable, right? Give you things that you can actually use instead of making you huddle down, hunker down, you know, in a in a bomb shelter you don't need, or hunker down in in fear that you got to unplug all your appliances at night. Um, that's not how to live your life. You can't live your life like that. And I don't I don't want to be responsible for for pushing that stuff just just to be more popular. That's ridiculous. I don't need it. So you know, if you can talk them off the ledge, I'll chat with them. But prior to that, yeah, I, I you know I, I'm happy just doing this and and happy trying to talk to people where I feel it we're actually making a difference in humanity um, without scaring the crap out of people for no reason. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh gosh, don't put your email there. Yikes. Okay, thank you, Greg. I will, I will write it down. Um, uh, yeah, Jerry and, and Mike, if you're still here, could you write that down for me and just in case I can't find it. Thank you, Greg. That was very, um, that was very brave of you to put your email down. <laughs> Everybody be nice. Don't, don't, you know, don't bombard them with emails. Um, Uranus. Yeah. You know what? I don't know much about Uranus. Uranus, no, Neptune is the one that's got 45 degree angle. I mean, it's really crazy. But some of these planets have just an, probably the most amazing space weather, but we just haven't done that much. We don't have any orbiters around them. We've only had flybys. So it's going to be neat when we finally get a chance to some of these big gas giants out in the far reaches uh, to really start having orbiters around, you know, spacecraft orbiting those and understand their space weather environments. It's going to be nice. I think that's going to, some of that may be funded actually by the exoplanet people because they want to understand space weather in exoplanets. Well, look at our exoplanets, right? Well, let's look at Uranus and Neptune and, and some of these ones we really haven't had a chance to orbit yet because they've got some really crazy um, space weather aspects to them, just like Jupiter does. I mean, the Jovian system is fascinating in terms of space weather. So um, yeah, I'm hoping that kind of stuff will come in the, in the future. It'll be fun. Uh, alien, okay, not a lot for 2010. I, I'm not sure what that Coke machine, a little 2012, a little like knowing a little Armageddon. Um, yeah, you know, again, it's all speculative when you start, start talking about some of these events. And, and I, I just want, don't, I want to give people things that are more actionable. What can you do today? You know, thinking about what am I going to do when the next superstorm Sandy hits? To me, that's not a way to live your life, right? If you're constantly worried about, okay, I'm going to have to survive another Hurricane Katrina, that could happen any day now. That is not a way I want people to feel like they need to live their lives. So, because um, that wouldn't make me feel good living my life that way. So why would I want anybody else to have to go through that? And so I don't perpetuate that kind of stuff. I don't want to. If those things happen, we will deal with them when they get, you know, when we see them. Until they get, until they, we see them, we will just do everything that we can to make people more informed and to make sure that they don't panic when the thing gets here. What we need are cool heads to prevail. If we do have a Carrington class event that occurs, we need people to stay calm. We need people to say, yes, we can get through this. It's just space weather. That's all it is. And if we don't, if we don't do that with the smaller storms, and if we don't do that with just normal space weather, then how the hell do we expect to stay calm when a big one hits, when or if a big one hits, right? So this is why I stay rational. This is why I don't go do the fear-mongering thing. There has no place in my world, and I don't want it to have any place in this community because I think this community is going to be the community people come to if a space weather event that's that extreme hits because this is where the rational uh, um, advice is going to come. This is where people who could really help you are going to be. This is where all the amateur radio operators are, and they're the ones that you're going to want to know if infrastructure is down because they're the ones who are emergency responders anyway, right? They know what to do in an emergency situation. They're definitely the people I'm coming to. So I'm, I'm unbelievably grateful that I have them embracing me in this community because it's, it's um, these, are, these are the people that are gonna save lives, right? So it's another reason why I stay rational and I don't engage in that fear-mongering stuff. Um, you are not an idiot, Coke machine, you silly man. Okay, be prepared, yes. 
Yeah, be an asset, not a liability in the event of a disaster. Exactly. Some SM Asho, that exactly right. Ash, thank you so much for that. Very smart. Okay, guys. Yeah, see, look at all this encouragement. I love it. You guys encourage each other. You know, nobody here is an idiot. Nobody, not a single person here. You are all wonderful, especially if you stayed here to the end. You're brilliant. And I love each and every one of you. So, um, yes, you'll be doing the rescuing. Yes, absolutely. I will count on all of us to rescue people because we will be needed. We will need these cooler heads to prevail. Mike says, I saw Weather Boy a story a few weeks ago. The headline was gloom and doom clickbait. If you read the long story, it was fairly accurate. Now, well, you know, it's it's sad. I mean, this this type of thing can can it it can just spiral out of control really, really quickly, and we just can't do it. We just can't fall for it. Um the CME in 2012, 723. Oh, that one, yeah. Oh, oh, no worries. No, you're not spamming the chat. No, you're talking about that that one that was a Carrington class event that missed Earth that hit stereo A. That was only one of three. We had two and a half, if not three, Carrington class events from Solar Cycle 24. Um, one of them was was the one that was on the sun's far side, uh, missed us entirely. Obviously, the one 2012 was one that hit stereo A, so we knew it. And then the other one was the one that clipped Earth. This is the one that happened in the second largest X-class flare of Solar Cycle 24 on September 10th. This was from Region 2673. I talk about it a lot. We actually had two two Carrington class events from that from that region. One was one that 2673 fired it on the sun's far side, and then it fired a second one on September 10th. The 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 region wasn't even in view anymore. It was on the sun's west limb, and we got a, an X 8.2, which was probably a lot higher flare than that, but it was partially blocked because it was behind the sun's limb. So the sun itself was blocking the flare. But even that, it was still an X 8.2. And this thing launched not just that solar flare, but it launched a radiation storm and it launched a CME that was so big that even though, and I, I always make this analogy, imagine me having a gun and I'm pointing the gun away from you, your earth. You have a gun pointing away from you and I fire that gun, but the bullet that comes out of that gun is so wide, it hits you. That was that Carrington class event. The damn thing was so big that even though it was fired on the sun's far side, it still clipped Earth and gave Earth six hours of a G1 magnetic storm. This thing, I argue, I had I have argued with, with um, Chris Mostel, who's a good friend of mine. I love him to death. As a matter of fact, he's a part of this Patreon community. He's one of the few scientists, one of my colleagues. He actually supports me here on Patreon. I, I just love him. He's just such a sweetie. Um, Chris is probably the most brilliant Heliophysicist, meaning meaning um, interplanetary uh, coronal mass ejection person. Uh, he his his bailiwick is exactly mine, and so for me to to say you know he's the most brilliant it shows you how much I how much respect I have for him. Um, he's better at doing my job than I am in terms of being a, a heliophysicist, um, and and I I I just love the work he does. He's so dedicated. And Chris, um, I argued with him about the. The, the, the event. He says, well, it wasn't Carrington class. And I said, you're right. It wasn't Carrington class at Earth. He said, the speed was too slow. I said, right, at Earth, because that was the flank. What if? What about the apex? Now, sadly, we didn't have a spacecraft that actually sampled it, because Stereo B was dead. So we didn't get a chance to see how strong that, 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 that CME was. But I showed him some model, you know, you know, the model outputs, and dang, that thing was fast. So the chances of it being a Carrington class event if we had hit it if the center of it the apex of it as opposed to hitting it at the flanks it's arguable chris did concede that point so that's why i say we had two and a half maybe three carrington class events because that event that happened on september 10th i still believe it was very likely carrington class if not it was just under just you know but my goodness i mean it just tells you what the sun can do so do we have carrington class events yeah we have them quite a bit and um Many of you should be very happy if Scott McIntosh is right, because if McIntosh at all is right and we get a very strong uh, ac solar activity cycle, the chances of getting Carrington class events goes down. It's the little activity cycles that you worry about, because that's when the sun's magnetic field is really complex. And that's where you get those really super extreme events. So again, with space weather, everything's a mixed bag. Bigger activity cycles means more events and more extreme events, but not the most extreme. 
Smaller activity cycles means you have less extreme events, you know, less events, period. But the ones that are extreme are insanely extreme. They're like off the charts extreme. So um, there's never, you know, you can't ever seem to have it go one way with space weather. You make something better and it always makes something worse. You make something worse, it always makes something better. I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is with space weather. So it's always a mixed bag. Okay, I am getting hoarse and it's been like three hours, right? Have we, have we've now passed the three hour mark with this Q&A? 231, um, whoa, yeah, we definitely have. So um, anyway, it's been, it's been great. And thank you for all of the fantastic questions. You guys have kept me talking for ages now. This is just great. I love that this has caused so much dialogue. Um, okay, if I could categorize she's got soul, I, I hope you mean me, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, dang, that's wild. Yeah. I mean, isn't it wild? I mean, there's so much fun stuff to talk about. I think it's, I'm probably overdue for doing a, uh, just an open, ask me anything, you know, an AMA, um, mini, mini course. It's just, you guys come to me with questions and I'll, we'll just unload, um, just for like a conversation. I might do that on Patreon. That's right. It, we've, we've had a couple of those on Patreon, so I might do that again soon. Okay, guys, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for, for being with me all this time. Is there a plan to replace these down satellites? Uh, it depends. All depends. Depends upon who's, who owns the satellites and what they're down for. And if there's others that can take over the job, there's, there's always, there's, it's, that's always a, a point of contention and it's always a moving target too. Julian, you ask, oh, you say, thank you so much for the specific answer on the Molnaya orbit. You're very welcome. It was you, Julian. I couldn't remember quite a techie Q&A, so it's interesting. Good, I'm so glad you liked it. And let me just check to see if there's any other questions on Patreon. Um, sometimes people put stuff on Patreon and I need to make sure that I am not missing anything. So give me just a sec as I step out of frame and I look. Um, Aloha, oh hi Melinda, I see you. Do you think solar weather affects Schumann residents? Um, why or why not? Actually, Melinda, no, Schumann resonances are terrestrial. They're terrestrial in nature. And it's because I think the low, the, um, low frequencies, and it's, it all has to do with the neutral atmosphere. So Schumann resonances have far much more to do with the neutral atmosphere, and I forget the details, but we can chat about it now that you're on Patreon. We can chat about that in more detail. Um, but no, it, it, um, I think they're, the Schumann resonance, the, the cavity resonance that it is, is just much, much lower. And um, because of the charged nature of the upper atmospheres, the way that the space weather ends up interacting is through the charged atmosphere and then down into the neutral atmosphere. So it ends up coupling into the neutral atmosphere and then the neutral atmosphere is what affects the Schumann resonances. So as far as I know, and I've heard other people tell me this, that no, it's far more affected by terrestrial weather. Um, if there is a, a space weather component, it probably is that it's coupling in through enhancing terrestrial weather, right? And then the terrestrial weather is what ends up being the dominant driver of Schumann resonance issues. I think lightning is a big one, right? Uh, I forget, but um, but yeah, we can chat about that more. So in, in a very interesting question. And yeah, I do have people ask me about doing Schumann resonance um, reporting, and I just don't because it's neutral atmosphere. It's really not space weather. It kind of gets me off topic. So I don't really do that. Thanks for sharing, guys and dolls. Cool, cool summer days and good energy to all. Uh, agreed. Very nice. Okay, guys. Yeah. Bye for now. Um, you're you're very welcome, and you guys have been fantastic. Um, and thank you again for all the wonderful questions. Um, if and Martin, if you how does South Atlantic anomaly affect our satellites? That was in this mini course. So go back and review the mini course, and you'll see all sorts of different effects. Uh, that the South Atlantic anomaly does. We even talk about how it moves. So, okay, guys. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad you and you enjoyed it. And uh, bang a drum. Hey, yes, that's what I, that's what I might do this afternoon. I'll go play my kit and release some of this good energy. Really nice. Okay, uh, talk to you soon, guys. And again, thank the moderators, both Jerry and uh, Mike, for for keeping people in check. Um, and it's been, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, mini course and see you again in about a month.